And welcome everybody to the Gym Masters Show live all around the world. It's terrific to have you with us this Sunday. Hope you guys are having a terrific day wherever you're watching. I am your host, Jim Masters, and we do this show every single day live. <laughs> Balancing this with my professional work, I'm a professional television and radio uh, presenter, personality, host, voiceover artist, narrator, journalist, actor, writer, producer, stage MC. Been doing this work for years, and it is about 29 weeks ago or so that we created this Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show series, built the home studio here. We broadcast out of the United States of America uh, in the greater New York City area along the southern New England coast between New York and Boston. And our normally scheduled hours, our regularly scheduled broadcast hours, are 7 p.m. Eastern, uh, 4 p.m. Pacific. We're doing a very special show today at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, and 8 p.m. for all of our fans over in Ireland, Scotland, and England, GMT time. Also, we have uh, viewers watching right now in South Africa, where I think it's 2,200. We have an, inter uh, an international audience of viewers who watch us literally uh, every single day, and uh, they call themselves loveities, <laughs> which I think is really, really cool. What happened was I always say this show is about positivity and inspiration and light love and levity. And what happened was I said love and levity too fast and created levity. So ever since I did that, all the guests, all the viewers from around the world who tune into our show daily said, Jim, we love that word. So the word lovity has been coined and associated with the Gym Master Show Live. So all the viewers out there watching right now call themselves the Lovities. They call this Lovity Hall <laughs> and they have uh, crowned me Mr. Lovity. All the guests as well, they are Lovities as well and they get uh, indoctrinated into Lovity Hall. So we welcome you and we thank you very much for making us a part of your day. We always toast our viewers first around the world. We say welcome to you and you and you and you and you and we thank you very much for joining us. Looks like a very expensive uh, drink, doesn't it? Like a martini in this big glass. It's nothing more than just some flavored water on a Sunday. <laughs> That's about it. We are wearing our Irish green proudly, of course. As I've mentioned, I'm Irish on my father's mother's side. They hail from Ireland and settled in uh, Manhattan in New York City and then Astoria, Queens, and from there branched out even further across the United States. And it's a pleasure to welcome everybody watching. You know, of course, our very special guest on this very special episode of our series is the one and only Phil Coulter, legendary, renowned Irish composer, arranger, songwriter, musician, pianist, uh, beloved not just in Ireland and Europe, but here in the United States and internationally. And then Phil and I were just chatting moments ago before we uh, went live with the show. And uh, I was telling him how I've always felt just this one degree of separation because of all of the, the relations and friends and, and colleagues, as well as people that I've had an opportunity to interact with, people I've interviewed, uh, all the Irish tenors, all Celtic Thunder and Celtic Woman and Frank Patterson and you know all of the, the High Kings, you name them, we've had an opportunity to interview them on American television, a lot on public television as well. So, and many have popped on this show as well as very special guests. So uh, very honored to have him here. I've always admired his work. I've admired his quick Irish wit, I've admired his talent, and I've always admired his understanding of the human condition. And he has this extraordinary book, which is his memoir. And I think if you haven't picked this up yet, it is uh, something that you should, uh, Bruised Never Broken. We'll talk about this in just a moment. Uh, he sent this to me personally and autographed it, which I really appreciate. He's truly a class act. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about him if you're joining us for the first time and maybe you know just the surface of who this extraordinary man is in the world of uh, not just Irish music. I'm talking about music that really touches the, the lives of all of us in such a beautiful way. Um, he is somebody that, again, has had an opportunity to really express himself and he's been doing that since uh, 
February 19th, 1942. <laughs> Irish musician and songwriter, record producer. He was awarded the gold badge from the British Academy of Songwriters, Composers, and Authors in October 2009. Phil Coulter has amassed 23 platinum discs, 39 gold discs, 52 silver discs, two Grand Prix Eurovision Awards, five Ivor Novello Awards, which includes Songwriter of the Year, three American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers Awards, a Grammy nomination, a Meteor Award, a National Entertainment Award, and so much more. He is one of the biggest record sellers in all of Ireland, uh, if not beyond. He is a very humble person too about all of this. He was born in Derry, Northern Ireland, where his father was a Catholic policeman in the Royal Ulster Constabulatory. And he grew up with his two brothers and two sisters. And Phil's father, also called Phil, encouraged music in the house. And aren't we glad that he did. He played the fiddle while his wife played the upright piano. And uh, Phil says he recalls the piano as the most important piece of furniture in the house. He always stayed away from the fiddle having uh, inflicted enough pain on his family with the piano. <laughs> Phil confesses that he uh, came close to abandoning the piano at an early age. The truth is, he, truth, believe it or not, is he hated the piano at first, but he loved to say he was a natural at it, but he wasn't. He hated playing it and hated the music teacher as well. But his father was a canny man who told him, we have to uh, scrimp and save to pay for these lessons, so you might as well give them up. It wasn't long before he gravitated back to the piano, trying to play the songs that he was listening on the radio, and he always wondered why his left hand was what, what it was supposed to be doing, <laughs> which is funny. I love his wit. But after two or three years at uh, St. Columbus College, he began thinking of the piano as an extension of, of himself. One of Coulter's most popular songs, The Town I Love So Well, deals with the embattled city of his youth filled with that, as he says, damned barbed wire uh, during the Troubles. He spent his secondary school years at St. Columbus College. He later studied music and French at Queen's University at Belfast, uh, Ireland. And Phil has received honorary doctorates from the University of Ulster in Dublin Institute of uh, Technology. We'll talk with him directly about his extraordinary career because I'd love to welcome him uh, on the show directly. He is just, he's a class act as much as he is an extraordinary international talent. He is seated at his beautiful piano surrounded by the love and accolades that have uh, been bestowed him, and uh, rightfully so. Let's welcome direct from Ireland here exclusively on the Gym Master Show Live, my friend and yours, the one and only Phil Coulter. Phil, good afternoon or good evening to you. Welcome to our show, my friend. It's a pleasure to have you here. Pleasure's mine, brother Jim, and I'm very flattered that you wore your green sweater, especially in honor of your uh, visit to Ireland. Absolutely. Yes, the Irish heritage is very important, and uh, we celebrate that, and we celebrate you. Uh, interesting story. I love the book. We'll talk about the book in just a Thank second, you. but a very interesting, you're welcome, very interesting story as far as how, you know, in those early years and the troubled times where you had grown up in Northern Ireland, and we have viewers, lots of viewers that watch us throughout Ireland. Um you know, it was a different day. It was a different time. There was a lot of troubles. There wasn't a lot of money. Things were scarce. You had to scrimp and save. Um, tell us about those early years and how those early years and those challenges formed Phil in those early years. And you still remember them and you pay homage to them so beautifully, Phil. Yeah, well, I mean, uh I, I was born uh, just in the uh, in the tail end of the, the last couple of years of the war, 1942. So my memories uh, of growing up as a kid uh, in Derry, our little terrace house, um, my memories would be in black and white, Jim. You know, I mean, yeah. it was it was pretty joyless. Um, things were very uh, were very bleak. Uh, outside our front door, there was an air raid shelter. Uh, which had been uh, which had been in use for uh, for the for the years of the war. Um, I grew up in a, a period of of rationing. When you went to the grocery store to buy your goods, you had to you had to give over coupons. Um, and so, 
you know, I grew up with a, with a, a sense of appreciation of, of we, we didn't have any great luxuries in our house, that's for sure. I mean, in our street, I was I was um, I was at university before the first before the first automobile arrived in our street. Um, I was I was at university before we got a television in our in our house. So um, uh, while we didn't have any great luxuries, I, you know what it, it taught me to appreciate things that are more important. And as as life has brought me on the on the journey that has brought me, um, more and more uh, I see that that the important things in life, the things that endure, are not necessarily you know um, those those things that you can acquire through through money. Um, you know, there are a lot of I've, I've met a lot of very wealthy people who are not really very well, very, very happy people. I've met a lot of um, people who barely make ends meet, but who are much finer people who are more content within themselves. And that would be that kind of contentment is something that I would aspire to. I've no desire to be to be a, a mogul. I've no desire to to uh, to own a, a chain of companies around the globe. I've no desire to have um, a chateau in the south of France. And uh, and a uh, a yacht in Barbados, you know. I'm 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 blessed that I've made a career for fifty five years out of uh, out of my talent, a gift from God, really. And honestly, when I look back on on that career, I've been very fortunate that I've endured for this length of time. Um, I look back, I've I've had a career which is which has kept me in a, a lifestyle which is comfortable without being luxurious or or, or flamboyant. Um, I brought a lot of kids into the world. I've been I've been able to 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 cherish them, to uh, to educate them, and to, uh, to 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 watch them grow into fine adults. So I've got a lot to be grateful for, Jim. An awful lot to be grateful for. You really, really do. And uh, and those early years, the piano was not, as I mentioned in that brief introduction, uh, that just really scratched the surface of your extraordinary background and career. The piano wasn't something that you took to immediately, right? No, I mean, I was, uh, where I came from uh, in Derry, music was very, very important. Uh, you know, there were, there were little terrace houses where, um, and including our own, where a piano would have been more important than like a three-piece suite of furniture. Music was part of the fiber of life. In those dark days, the post-war era, um, we learned to, uh, you know, the, 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 we couldn't afford any outside entertainment. So people people learned to uh, to entertain themselves. That's why live music was always very important. To have a p piano in the house was, uh, was a real, you know, was a real boon. So, well, of course, we had a piano, my, my elder brother's, um, and uh, and my elder sister, both they were all sent to piano lessons. I was sent to piano lessons, um, and as you mentioned earlier on, I I'd love to be able to tell you that I just took to it like a like a, like a, like a doctor water. I didn't, because I had a. Uh, I mean, I I I remember going to my early piano lessons, and I thought this is going to be great. Mm. I'm going to learn to play those little songs that I'm singing in school, um, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Well, the fun didn't last too long because it was all of a. All that kind of piano exercises and uh, all that kind of boring stuff, coupled with the fact that my, my music teacher sat here at the yeah. top of the piano with a rule, right? So if I played a wrong note, crack on the knuckles. That was, that was, uh, that was his way of motivating me yeah. to, to, to practice a little harder. Um, and to this day, to this day, uh, here's the thing. A lot, a lot of my, my piano playing um, friends will notice that when I play piano, I have got what we call a very high stance like that. Yeah. And I'm sure that dates back to my days with my first piano teacher when, when a kid starts playing the piano, they play very flat, you know. But I think... Um, six months of getting cracked with the with the rule were yeah. enough to, to maybe kind of go a little bit higher. So, so I didn't enjoy it to begin with at all, at all. And um, my my uh, my 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 parents had 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 insisted that I practice for half an hour every day. Um, but I came up with a great scheme where in the parlor where the piano was located, there was um, a fancy clock which had been given to my parents as a, as a wedding present by, by a pretty well-to-do uncle. And it chimed on the half hour. That was the thing. So I came up with this brainwave. If I, if I went in to start my piano, my piano practicing at, say, 5 p.m., 
And then my parents listened for the for the half hour chime to where I could stop practicing. So I thought, I, I've got I've got the answer to this. So I I kept pushing the clock forward. So I would start I would start my practicing. <laughs> the clock said five o'clock, but I put it forward it was like ten past. So that I got away that for a surprisingly long time. So cutting the the, the 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 designated half hour very short until inevitably one day I broke the I broke the clock, and that was it. The game yeah. was up. Uh, the game was up. My 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 misdemeanor was reported to my to my father, the cop, and um, yeah, he he gave me a thick ear for breaking the piano or for breaking the clock. <laughs> and he said, you know, listen, if your if your heart's not in the music, let's just forget about it. Which was which was music to my ears. I mean, I I rejoiced in the fact that I didn't have to put up with anymore. That I could now maybe start playing something else. So I was glad to say goodbye to the piano, and then. Um, in the in the couple of years that 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 uh, that uh, ensued, being attracted to music, and listening on the radio to to pop songs, and and beginning to to pick out songs off of the radio, uh, that was the beginning of my love affair. And I can still remember, I can still remember the first tune that I could pick out on the piano, I, I, because it was all it was all the black notes. It was a song called Buttons and Bows. That was my first tune. Mm. Um, so yeah, so then th 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 that now became alive to me, you know. Now then, then I could I could I could play I could play pieces of music that were you know that were songs that were that were tunes that other people would recognize as well. So then, um, as you mentioned earlier on, being able to do that is one thing. But what happens down here? So it took me a long time to figure out. What happens down with the left hand? So then, uh, when I started at St. Columns College, um, it was a great lesson to learn, uh, which was motivation. Yeah, the best motivation in the world is when you want to do something. I wanted to learn. I wanted to find out how this all works. How you, two hands can be at the piano, and how the, the left hand supports the right hand. And you know, when I that was why I was at what 11, 12 years of age. That was one hell of a lesson, you know, that when you want to do something, that's the best motivation of all. Mm. So then where did it go from there? How did you then take that motivation and really bring it to life in the way that you've been able to do that, Phil? Well, here's the thing, Jim. In my, in, in, in my town, Derry, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, post-war years were pretty dark. Yeah. Derry was, a, was an unemployment black spot, right? Um, um, there were a lot of men that were unemployed, a lot of men who were unemployed. Um, one, one way that, uh, that uh, a fellow could earn a few dollars on the side was if he was a musician. Um, during, during the war years and, and for a number of years afterwards, there were a lot of American personnel, uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, stationed in and around the Derry area, and also the RAF and, and some of the British, the British uh, troops as well. So where you get that concentration of, of, of troops, there's going, to be, there's going to be a social life. There are going to be dances. There are going to be socials, et cetera. And they're always looking for music. So there were little pickup bands, as we called them, around Derry, where um, a guy who would otherwise be unemployed but could play trumpet, he could pick up a few dollars by playing on weekends. So the point I'm making is it was always, oh, it was always something that I was aware of, that music is not only something that you study in college uh, or something that, that you sing in church on a Sunday or at the annual music festival, music can actually be a way to earn a living. Mm, right. It can actually be a profession. So right. that, I mean, that was a light bulb, but kind of, I mean, I, I, I kind of, um, I filed that one away at the back of my, at the back of my memory. But then when I went up to university in Belfast, I was there for four years and within the first term, I'd started my own little band. Um, and that was that was the beginning. That was the beginning of a kind of downward spiral <laughs> where I am today. After a while, I became unemployable. You know, after a while, I became unemployable. Once, once I got the taste for that, uh, and playing for student dances, and and having people enjoying the music, etc. And then in my uh, in my last year at university, some uh, some bright spark in the in the uh, uh, at, at colleges over here, we have uh, what they call a rag week, 
which is a week of kind of student stunts to raise funds for charity, right? So some bright spark came up with the idea of making a student record. Now, I was the guy about the university with a little band. I was the kind of go-to guy for uh, for pop music. So what was the said, name of the band? The band was called Phil Coulter and the Glee Man because I also, my last year, started a glee club, the Queen's University Glee Club, which I dreamed of because, again... I was I was in the first wave of scholarship boys who found their way into the university. Before that, university, Queen's University had been had been the preserve of the privileged, the sons and daughters of the well healed um, who could afford to send their their children to university. My father could never have afforded to send me to university. Seamus Heaney, the great poet, Nobel Prize winner, could never have uh, been afforded to go to university. John Hume. Uh, my great friend, also recently deceased, could never have gone to university, but for scholarship. There you so, are. There's the glee. Yeah, the first record, <laughs> "Fool in Time," was was the uh, was the, was the uh, was the song I wrote. We recorded that record for um, for uh, charity, and it was great adventure. You know, we did we did we did a lot of, of appearances. Um, sold, I suppose, we, we pressed up a few thousand records. Yeah. Um, but Jim, it was heady stuff, you know. Yeah, and when yeah. we, we strutted about the university like rock stars for a couple yeah. of weeks, that's all the reality dawned that we had to go back to work. But um, interestingly, that very that very song um, was the key that opened it up for me because uh, that summer, having recorded that little record, I was working in Donegal with those same musicians um, in a hotel in uh, in Donegal to work my my summer season, and while there. I bumped into one of the the big uh, the big bands in Ireland called the Capital Show Band, Butch Moore and the Capital Show Band, um, and I encountered them at the hotel. I'd lost no time at all in pressing a copy of that exact record into into the hands of the band leader and and the vocalist. And about six months later, I get the phone call. You know the phone call that changes your life. Mm -hmm. My phone call was from a man called Des Kelly, who's the leader of the Capital Show Band to say they were about to record the song and release it as their first single. The record industry was very much in its infancy in Ireland. So uh, I had my first song recorded and I had my first hit. It was a top three record in Ireland. And then, then I was definitely unemployable. There was definitely <laughs> no job that I could do other than write songs. <laughs> but you did, and that's the key. You you stuck with it. You went forward. When you look at it, uh, what would you consider, uh, Phil, uh, some of those initial sources of inspiration early on for you? And what would you consider maybe uh, one of those early big breaks that sort of opened the door a little bit to to push you forward and then give you exposure and opportunity that might not have existed previously? Very good question. I mean, without, without, without that fooling time, simple, I mean, you know, like a hit record in Ireland back then um, was, I mean, while, while, I, while it was very flattering and I was very excited, it was not a career, you know, but, but it was, it was, an, it was an entry. And I was fortunate that that the band then were invited to 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 London to record some more tracks. Um, I went to London and met their London agent, um, and he offered me a job. That was the beginning, really, of the journey, and it was a steep learning curve. Yeah. Music as an academic subject, or music as as something to do in a sam in a semi professional way, is one thing. Music as a profession, music as a means to earn a living, and certainly writing songs yeah. as a means to earn a living is a completely different thing. So my first three or four years was um, was serving my apprenticeship. I mean, that was uh, paying my dues, that was learning the craft and punching in a lot of, a lot of, a lot of long hours um, uh, at, at, at the coalface, you know? Um, my first job was as a kind of musical office boy, um, I, in my in my diluted notions of arriving in London, I thought that it was only going to be a matter of time before I would be arranging scores for the major orchestras in London. But I spent the first six months arranging sandwiches for the office girls. Yeah. That, that, was, that was the level I was. I was at the bottom. I was the bottom of the food chain. Yeah, literally. But, yeah, literally. Yeah, but you know, I was. I used to. I used to get the uh, the underground from my little uh, flat in North London, in a kind of Irish ghetto called Kilburn, where all the paddies seemed to hang out. And I got the underground into uh, 
to Piccadilly Circus. The office where I was uh, where I was working was in Soho, which is just off of Piccadilly Circus. And I would get out of the uh, the tube, I'd come up the escalator, and stand at Piccadilly Circus and just look at the bright lights oh, yeah. and the uh, the big red buses in London and the London cabs and the noise and the glamour and the colour and think this is a long, long way from uh, from post war Belfast or post war Derry. It was so exciting and it was heady stuff, but I was learning. That's the thing. And that's, that's, you know, that's a truth. That's a, that's a truth which is a, as, as valuable today as it was back then. That on, there, there, is, there is a great myth uh, perpetrated by, by a lot of talented people who believe that because they're talented, that the world owes them a living. Nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, they didn't get the memo, you know. Right. That, a talent only gets you into the start of the game. You know, it's it's what you do afterwards. It's your it's your dedication. It's your hard work. It's your doggedness. It's your reliability. It's your it's your it's your focus. It's all of those good things. Your determination that keeps you on that ladder and keeps you going. But uh, talent in itself, you know, um, for years I was a visiting professor in Boston College, and my opening my opening lecture to the to the new intake was this. I, I said, you're obviously very talented kids or you wouldn't be in Boston College studying music. Um, let me tell you something right now about your talent, what your talent entitles you to. And they're all sitting wide-eyed, listen to hear what, what I'm going to tell them the talent entitles them to. And I said, what your talent entitles you to is zero, nothing. Your talent is something you inherited from God. That's a gift from God you inherited from the genes of your parents. When you start doing something, working with your talent, uh, and hone it into something that 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 becomes uh, maybe a, a career, whatever. Then you can start congratulating yourself. But until such times as that, as you as you, you put those hours in and achieve that level, it's hard work. It still is. It really is. It really, really is. And that's the thing because sometimes these days people go into you know all of these lines of work. Um, chasing fame uh that's the big thing now is uh, as i want to be i just want to be seen i want to be known i want to be famous and a lot of people i've had an opportunity to chat with have all said not the way to do it not the answer because flame is uh fame is so fleeting uh it's can be empty and what happens yeah. when it disappears you have to have uh, the drive, you have to have the passion and you have to really be committed and you have to love it because there's gonna be a lot of blood, sweat and tears. It's not gonna be all, you know, limos and jets and, uh, you know, filet mignon dinners. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes and in all of these things that we do in the arts. So we're on this, we're in this time now where fame seems to be what a lot of people are chasing, but I'm sure you would agree that's not the thing you should be chasing, right? No, I, I, no, I was taught very early days. My very first boss, who um, who, who, who spelled it all out and said, um, "Big mistake uh, at your stage now, starting off. You're very, you can, you're obviously talented, and you've got an ability to work hard. That's the combination of talent and hard work will get you further down the road. I can't promise you you're going to make a million dollars, but it will get you further towards your goal. Um, and if you start if you start concentrating on on uh, on the money that you're going to earn, or the fame that you're going to write, uh, yeah. you get it back to front. You know, you're yeah. really getting it. You're getting it back to front. Um, yeah. You know, and fame. You know, it's it's uh, it's it's a hard to define thing as well. You know, it can be it can be a double edged thing. It's a bit like it's a bit like happiness. You know, happiness yeah. is not an ongoing condition. There's no such thing as as somebody who's happy every moment of every hour of every day. Uh, at this stage in my life, I've I've realized, Jim, that that. Happiness is something when there are moments when the planets are on the line and everything just gels, you know, and, and there are those moments you think, thank you, God. Then what you have to learn to do is slow that down, just freeze frame that moment. And when you're thanking God, just breathe deep because that's a moment where everything is just gelled. It's not, it's not going to last forever, that's for sure. But you got to savor it. You got to lock it away in your memory bank and think, thank God for that. Um, because you know, it's it's happiness. Fame is the same thing. Fame is a very ephemeral thing. It comes and goes too readily. Um, people get carried away by their fame, as a lot do. Um, here's a problem. There's a lot of there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of there's a, a kind of generation who 
because they become uh, famous in, in, in our business, um, decide that because they've sold, maybe, maybe had a few hit records or sold a million albums, whatever, they convince themselves that that entitles them to live their lives by a different rule book from the rest of us, you know, um, because they happen to have been, you know, been success or, or, as I say, won a few awards, whatever. That's, I mean, that's uh, toxic. That's really toxic. That leads to a lot of unhappiness. That leads to a lot of wasted lives, leads to a lot of addictions, you know. Um, the guy, you know, the people that I really admire in, in the music business, those who endure, you mm -hmm. know, those who endure. You know, if you ask me to nominate, like, the guys uh, that I would look up to, I'm talking about Paul Simon and James Taylor and Mark Knopfler, um, Randy Newman, the guys who are still doing it. You know the guys who are working, still doing it. The, the you know they still they still turn out the quality. Bruce Springsteen guys have got the appetite for work. You know that's what they all have in common. See, that's the key. They are there and they're still doing it like you are, and that is the true test of time, and talent, and uh, and resilience. There, the re it really requires a lot of resilience, doesn't it, Phil? To it's obviously a demanding industry, an ever changing industry as well, and uh, you know it, it takes a lot out of you uh, many times, but at the same time. Uh, it gives you such joy and such breath and to be able to communicate through music. But resilience is a key thing, isn't it? Yeah, we were, I, was, I was talking just, just a little while ago about uh, there was a, some, a, new, a new kid on the block, a new, a new uh, songwriter who'd had a, who'd had a few hits, um, but was kind of a, becoming a little bit obnoxious in his, in his behavior. And one of my, one of my fellow songwriters, one of the, one of the vintage guys of, 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 my, of my kind of era, said, that little asshole, he said, he hasn't even been in the game long enough to know what a cold spell is. And there's, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of wisdom in that. You know, when you've when you've when you've encountered a cold spell and writer's block, then you know what it's like when it all just seems to disappear. And resilience, good word. You know, you got to knuckle down and you got to just uh, keep chipping away, keep chipping away. And and you know, you got to have the faith in your in yourself. You got to have the faith in your talent faith in God and and apply yourself. I, I don't think you're entitled. Nobody's entitled. I don't think, you know, because even when I'm on the road, you know, last time I toured America, great success, and we, we, we did sold out business. That doesn't entitle me to think that next, when I'm back in America that I'm entitled to do the same thing again. You know, when I make a, when I make a, a new album, I'm not entitled to think that, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to sell a million records, it's going to be number one. No, no. It's going to be. It's only going to be as good as the as as the effort that, that I put into it. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So you've had an opportunity, Phil, to work with some extraordinary people over the years, uh, including Elvis Presley. Tell us about some of the interactions you've had along the way that, uh, if people are discovering for the first time, might surprise them, but might also uh, remind people of some of the incredible people you've had an opportunity to collaborate with. It's extraordinary. Yeah, everybody from, I mean, the, going back to the early days where we started off the conversation, um, one of the, uh, one of the, um, one of the first acts that, uh, that I worked with was, uh, was Van Morrison and yeah. them, um, on, uh, Gloria, which is a classic record. I was playing organ on that track. Um, um, I was, I was musical director for a lot of the, the early Van Morrison and them records. Um, one of their early tracks, a song called "I Can Only Give You Everything," which I wrote for for Van Morrison and them. It's not kind of a garage band staple. Um, that was uh, to see Van's career go from then to become the legendary figure that that he's become. And uh, some years back, we collaborated on uh, on an album where um, we assembled a, a colorful cast to do versions of Van Morrison songs, um, including the likes of Liam Neeson, who did a spoken word version of. Uh, of a song called Coney Island. Um, down through the way back then as well, I played on the sessions with Tom Jones when he was he was just a rookie up from um, from from the from from Wales from South Wales. Wales. Right. Yeah. Um, always always had a great presence. He was he was a bit of a rough diamond in the early days, but um, when he would come about the office, I do remember he was always very polite and very charming to the girls, and of course 
create a little bit of a buzz anytime Tom arrived. Um, you mentioned Presley. I think probably, you know, it's one of my prouder boasts. Being, uh, being as how uh, I'm of a vintage where I can remember when Elvis Presley came on the scene and completely transformed popular music. You know, he made it so much more visceral, so much more exciting, so much more sexy, really. Um, it's, it's, it's not to say that pop songs didn't exist before Elvis Presley, but they were kind of twee, you know. They were kind of cutesy song. Like, um, I can remember songs like, How Much Is That Doggy in the Window? Yeah. You know, or She Wears Red Feathers on a Hooli Hooli Skirt. <laughs> or what was it? There's a pawn shop around the corner in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. They were cute songs, of course they were. But, I mean, Presley just rewrote that book. So... You can you can just visualize me in my little attic bedroom with my two brothers um, back in Derry when I'm when I'm uh, like 13, 14, 15, uh, listening to Elvis Presley singing Hound Dog, Don't Be Cruel, Heartbreak Hotel. Wow, that was a whole new game alongside of Buddy Holly doing That'll Be the Day, Little Richard, Fats Domino. <laughs> Those, that's when I fell in love with, with pop music in those in those glorious days of uh, in the fifties when, when there were so many there was a population there was an explosion of pop music back then. You think of uh, you think of all of those um, wonderful songs that came out of the fifties and the sixties. So you know I, I consider myself to be very blessed to have been at that stage in my life um, and beginning my musical career when uh, when when you when you had songs like that going when all the other thing back in those days when i was beginning to fall, fell in love with pop music um instrumental records piano records yeah i don't hear them anymore but there were piano records everywhere i mean uh one of my early heroes uh was floyd kramer oh yes country piano i spent jim masters i have to tell you this i spent hours at the at the piano trying to figure out how the hell is he making that sound? Instead of playing, it's I spent forever, forever trying to figure that out. Uh, then, then when I finally got what it is, what contra piano is, is um, is just transferring onto piano the sound of a steel guitar. You know, right. the right. steel guitar. If a steel guitar player plays that chord, he just depresses a pedal and the middle note depresses. So he gets that kind of hammer on. So um, with Floyd Kramer, that was one of my first, one of my first love affairs. Um, and in fact, one of my, the very first record I ever made was, was a Floyd Kramer inspired version of, uh, of Danny Boy, uh, the, uh, the London Dairy Air, which I recorded, my God, long before Classic Tranquiller. I recorded this, I think back in, in, uh, in 
God bless Floyd Kramer. Absolutely. Beautifully, beautifully done, my friend. Really beautifully done. You know, uh, there's a song that I have always loved. I mean, I, I love all of your material. A couple people have requested it. The first time that I had an opportunity, I was mentioning to when we were chatting prior to going live, um, to really hear it and hear it done uh, exceptionally as well, was when I interviewed John McDermott. Uh, right. it, it was for a PBS special and he was here in the States and he was here live in the studio and it was part of the special and it was the old man. And, right. and, and you're performing it, him performing it, the guys from Celtic Thunder performing it, whoever. It's just one of those songs that really i mean it says it all in words but also in melody and and composition and arrangement um tell us about that particular song because that i know means a lot to you but it has become a song that touches so many people uh and i've just absolutely always been touched whenever i hear that song that's the kind of song too that uh you might need a box of Kleenex with you <laughs> as you yeah. listen to it, if you really pay attention to the words and the meaning, the inspiration for that song, Phil. Well, um, as a songwriter, um, songwriter stroke record producer, which I've been fortunate to, to have I've hold, held those dual roles for many years, the perfect situation um, as a producer, if, if you are if you're producing an artist or producing a, a group where there's a singer that you can tailor a song towards, you know, if it's got a voice that <clears throat> rather than write a song and then trying to trying to persuade a singer to, to, to record it. So just as in the in an earlier period, I I, I was producing the Dubliners, um, and and probably the greatest voice that Ireland ever produced in that whole area of folk music, Luke Kelly. Mm. To have Luke Kelly on hand to sing songs like Scorn Not His Simplicity or uh, The Town I Love So Well, that's a gift for a songwriter, knowing when you're writing the song, this is the voice that's going to sing it. So um, and subsequent to the Dubliners, I was then producing another night called The Fury Brothers. Um, and they had their lead singer, Finbar Fury, had one of those great storytelling voices. Um, um, and so, again, when I sat down to write... Uh, the old man. I knew. I mean, I knew the importance of my my father in my life and in in, uh, in my music. And the Fury Brothers, who were four brothers, um, and 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 uh, one of their friends, had been had, had grown up and very much in a musical household, inspired by their dad. So they had that same reverence and that respect for their father. So there was a kind of communality there, and I knew that I knew that uh, Finbar could uh, could deliver the song. So it was a. Uh, it was, yeah, it was one of those songs that you kind of just draw from personal experience. It was a very different exercise, Jim, from writing a song like that uh, to writing like Saturday Night for the Bay City Rollers, you know. Um, yeah. it was kind of, it's two separate things, you know, two separate yes, things. Absolutely. Um, writing pop songs, writing pop songs, What you, you, your job is to try and get records in the charts, you know. My Boy for Elvis Presley, that was... Um, you know, you're trying to get, you're trying to sell a million records and get into the charts. A song like "The Old Man" was not geared uh, to the charts, not geared to the catch register. It was just, it was a personal song. Um, and a funny thing, with the passage of years, the songs that have stayed important to me uh, in the great scheme of things. Um, while I'm very proud of, you know, the songs that sold a million records, so very proud of the songs I did for the Bay City Rollers or Elvis Presley or anybody else. The the songs that still have a resonance. In my own heart and soul, are those personal kind of songs? Be it the old man or scorn out his simplicity or the town I love so well. Those are the songs that, um, and that's the irony, Jim. That's the irony. Yeah. That those are the songs that were not written 
to try and get into the charts. They were written com from completely different motivation. Yet those are the songs that have sustained and certainly yeah. have sustained in my own heart and soul. They're your signature. There's a certain signature that you have, Phil, with your music and uh, that that stands out, that, that cuts through the mass of all the other material that floats out there. Um, those songs, though, like you said, you know, you've you've worked with some of the greats, and uh, everybody remembers Saturday Night, Saturday Night with the Bay City, City Rollers, yeah. which you still hear on the radio here in the states. Yeah. But these other songs uh, that you're talking about are the ones that really, I think, speak to the core. As I mentioned, when you and I were chatting before we went live, you have this wonderful ability. Um, to really capture the human condition, uh, the human spirit, uh, human emotion through your stories, through your life experiences, the ups, the downs, the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it that makes you a complete human being, Phil Coulter. But at the same time, deliver it with beautiful melodies and instrumentation and musicianship and arrangements and compositions that touch people in ways that go to the core that sometimes they probably can't even put in words when they hear the music they they feel whatever it is that you're relating to them and you make it relatable you make it though these have grand essences to them there's there's simplicity to them that they and i think things in life whether it's movies television music whatever friendships it's the simplicity that really st stands the test of time. Mm -hmm. And these songs are so relatable and so deep. You have this extraordinary uncanny way to connect with people and the human condition, and you have an understanding of it through your own life experiences that you can tell these stories and song that uh, move people. It's good of you to say it, so Jim. I, I, I think I think if I look back on 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 the, on the kind of catalog through uh, through all of the years, going right back to, well, I think I got my first really major hit in 1967 when uh, we won the Eurovision Song Contest with a song called "Pop It on a String," sold like six or seven million records. That's right. Um, and congratulations, the following year did, did did the same. But again, they were specific songs that were written for a specific reason, which was the Eurovision Song Contest. So I've, I've said many times that I was in a very fortunate position that those commercially successful songs, are you with me now? They subsidized right. my, my songwriting with the likes of, of the Dubliners or, or any of the folk groups which were not maybe geared to be commercial. They weren't meant to sell millions of records. They were written for a different motivation and written with a different sensitivity. And so I'm fortunate that that I had the success, the commercial success with those other songs that I could afford to spend the time um, on um, on songs that were a little bit more of, of, of myself. Somebody, um, somebody that agrees with me is Roy Buckley. He's watching. <laughs> and I know you're working with Roy. What a legacy. Phil has made an indelible mark on both Irish and world music. And I concur, Roy. Roy's going to be a guest coming up in December on our show as well. We welcome Roy. Uh, you're, you've been working with Roy as well. Can you um, play the old man for us? I know there's been a lot of requests for that one. How can I, how can I refuse you, Jim? Especially if you're wearing your green sweater. We're I, ready to I, go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Turn the and we've got our glass. I mean, we're all set. Everything Irish. <laughs> the tears have all been shed now. We've said our last goodbye. His soul's been blessed, he's laid to rest, and it's now I feel alone. He was more than just my father, my teacher, my best friend. And he'll still be heard in the tunes we shared when I play them on my own. And I never will forget him. For he made me what I am And though he may be gone 
memories linger on. And I miss him, the old man. As a boy, he'd take me walking by mountain, field, and stream. And he'd show me things not known to kings, but secret between him and me. Like the colors on a pheasant as he rises in the dawn. Or how to fish or make a wish beside a fairy tree. And I never will forget him, for he made me what I am. And though he may be gone, memories linger on. And I miss him, the old man. So big and strong, but the minutes fly and the years roll by for a father and the son. And suddenly, when it happened, there was so much left unsaid. No second chance to tell him thanks for everything he done. And I know. For he made me what I am, and though he may be gone, memories linger on. God, I miss him, the old man. Exactly. The old man. exactly. I love that that deep breath and the to the diaphragm that you took after it. Uh, it's a very very touching song, and uh, a lot of people commenting uh, so poignant uh, from Bernadette, incredibly beautiful from Juanita, who's watching in South Africa. Juanita Kutsi in, in South Africa. Hello. She's yeah. It. yeah we, we have an international audience. No, you do. Yes, I know. Barely that there's some of my my lockdown loungers there. Sherry says had to get a tissue. Doesn't get any better than Phil <laughs> singing it. Uh, yeah, my heart miss my daddy. So Bernadette. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, amazing gift. Some people it was the first time they heard the song. You're playing it now. Uh, thank you, Jim and Phil. This is a gift. Getting chills listening to Phil sing this song. So beautiful, beautiful song. Lots of uh, Irish hearts. Uh, absolutely love this song. Nathan McCourt says, uh, my good friend Phil from Derry. Oh, Nathan. Yes, indeed. Good boy, Nathan. You yeah. keep watching. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, some really nice comments coming in here. Uh, Mike and Jen, this one caught me as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you. The old man, my dad passed peacefully on August 26th and per his request, we played this upon his last breath. Wow. I'm sure you've heard that a lot, huh? Yeah, it's a song that features a lot in, in uh, a lot of, I've, I've, it's a song that has, that has provoked a lot of uh, rather response, more than, more than so many of my other songs. It certainly has struck a chord. And in that kind of, in that kind of situation, it's a song which is played a lot as, as, as dads are being laid to rest. Yeah. Um, People have people have chosen that as the kind of as the final farewell, you know, and it's um, it's very flattering to me and, and very touching, and I'm 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 so appreciative of that. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, one of our viewers requested a song, uh, "Kindred Spirit," to play that. Yeah. Um, well, I, I could play a bit of it. I, it's you, here's the thing. Um, I uh, when when I when I tour when I perform I do my concert. I have I have granted myself the license to sing my own songs, not anybody else's songs, because 
I know. Um, I thankfully I didn't embark on a career as a singer, but I have I have I have this feeling that there is a certain kind of an integrity about a songwriter singing his own songs. I Nobody agree. sings Randy Newman songs like Randy Newman. Nobody sings Tom Waits songs like Tom Absolutely. Waits. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Um, so you know you grant the singer a little bit of license there. A song like a song like Kindred Spirits. I wrote specifically for Celtic Thunder, and specifically it was a song that was a high performance song for a voice that was, you know, um, that had a big range, which I don't have. So sometimes uh, I write songs that are specifically for another performer, um, but I would never, um, never in my wildest dreams attempt to sing them because it could be, it could all end in tears. It could be <laughs> a real crash and burn. Um, I could, uh, I, I could, um, Kindred spirits, let me see. I've never played that before. Um, that is it's when I was writing the song, um, but it's, it's been yeah, it's been sung by some by some uh, some wonderful singers. And and again, uh, as a songwriter, you know, I've said this many times, Jim, that a, 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 a singer can pay no greater compliment to a songwriter than to sing or to record one of the songs. You know, and I still feel that. I still feel that. Mind you, sometimes, sometimes it's hard to feel that enthusiastic when some of your kind of well-established songs, like uh, uh, "The Town I Love So Well," I've heard that I've had that I've heard that murdered on more than one occasion by drunk men at Irish weddings. Yeah. You know, so there are times there are times a little bit of grievous bodily harm is inflicted on your song, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you have to be grateful that somebody's singing it. Well, even hearing the instrumental, uh, Susan absolutely loved it. They they just really, you know, the comments, they're thrilled that you did that. And that was very gracious of you as well. I want to let folks know too, because uh, you're very humble about all the things that you've experienced in your life, Phil. Um, Phil has uh, sold out uh, Carnegie Hall four times. Uh, he's had a Royal Command performance, and many of them from Japan to Finland, three personal invitations from the President of the United States to perform at the White House, playing live. A previous to president, let it be said, a previous president. Yeah. <laughs> playing, yes. Playing live to 600,000 outdoors on Capitol Hill to Washington, D.C. with the National Symphony Orchestra, marching at the head of the famous St. Patrick's Day Parade in New York City, recorded and toured with, of course, Sir James Galway, who we love. They're watching as well, uh, Sir James and Jean. We say hello to them as well. They're wow. friends. Yeah. Hey, Jimmy. Jeannie, hi, hello. I'm flattered that you guys are watching. Yeah, there. I, uh, I met them when I was... Uh, I'm seeing a concert uh, at Carnegie Hall, and we've stayed in touch, and they're, they're wonderful people, as you know. Sharing the bill with Gregory Peck at St. Patrick's Cathedral, and the memories are so vivid, special, and cherished. Jimmy, Jimmy was also on that gig. He remember that with Gregory Peck. We call, it's a show we call Both Sides Now. Jimmy and I being from the north of Ireland and from, from two different uh, persuasions, two different cultures, if you like, um, it was there was a significance beyond the purely musical with our collaboration. And we were aware of that. Um, and, and so we, we dreamed up this evening in St. Patrick's Cathedral, um, where um, we, 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 we drew upon all kinds of uh, uh, wonderful, Gregory Peck, as you say, uh, Frank McCourt, the writer, Edna O'Brien, um, Jimmy, of course, and myself, and a group called Different Drums of Ireland. Um, five lads from the two different, two different traditions, in, in in Ireland, playing everything from long drums to yeah. the big lambeg drums to the bowrons, etc. Um, it was it was a, a unique experience in, in St Patrick's Cathedral, never to be repeated. But Gregory oh. Peck, um, um, of all of the of all of the uh, 
of all of the stars and celebrities that I have encountered, be lucky enough to spend time with, um, I thought Gregory Peck was the most impressive. I, I, I said at the time, if uh, if there was a hierarchy in Hollywood, yeah, Gregory Peck would be the Pope. Yeah, yeah, yes, beautifully said. There's a question also, Phil, that came in. Um, I think it came in from Roy. Let's see if I can scroll back and we can find that one here. Roy asked a question. Let's see. Wow, look at all these questions coming in here. There's so many of them. Um, Good. There it is. Jim, can you ask Phil about working with uh, Billy Connolly and how the parody song Divorce came about? <laughs> uh, um Billy is a legendary figure in 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 in, uh, in this part of the world, um, and and in in recent years has has uh, has carved out a, a, a pretty high profile in uh, in the United States as well. Um, would have been very pally with the likes of of Robin Williams and Whoopi Goldberg and and all of those guys. Um, I I first uh, I first started working with Billy back in 1974. Sadly, sadly, but it's just been announced that Billy is going to do his very last television special before yeah. retiring because Parkinson's disease has caught up with him, and it makes it just impossible for him to to uh, to tour anymore, do any any more stand up. But um, I uh, yeah, I, I produced Billy's first album back in 1974. Produced all of his albums after that, and he was he was in our home in County Wicklow here some years back, and over dinner and a few glasses of wine. We decided we would write a parody on that particularly cheesy country song, D I V O R C. Um, and uh, we finished the dinner, finished the wine, and finished the parody. And the following week, I find myself in the studio with a little bit of time to spare. I'd, I'd finished kind of uh, an, an afternoon, I had an evening free. So I called Billy and I said, Get your ass over here and we'll record that little parody and see what, how we get on. So he did that. The following day, I kind of dressed it up a little bit, put a rhythm section on top. We played it to the record label Polydor Records, who who said, "Well, I'm not quite sure what to make of this, lads, but let's put it out and uh, and see what happens." There were no two people, Jim Masters, on the on the planet more surprised and delighted than Billy Connolly and myself when uh, when that record went to number one in the uh, in the UK chart. It was a uh, uh, see if I can remember. Our little dog is six years old and smart as any damn kid so when we mention the v-e-t he damn near flips his lid words like s-h-o-t shot and w-o-r-m worm these are words that make him s-q-u-i-r-m squirm S Q U A R A M T I N E starts today because he bit the V E T and then he ran away. He caused me and my wife to have a big fight and then both of them bit me. And that is why I'm gonna get a D I V O R C E. Yes, that is why I'm gonna get a D I V O R C E. Oh, serious stuff. <laughs> it shows versatility, versatility, Phil. Oh yeah, you can never take yourself too seriously, Jim. That's uh, that's that's you. You're not going to survive in this music business if you, if you believe all of your reviews are, uh, or if you listen too closely to your fans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how have you been um, dealing with the the, the uh, obvious situation that we've been all dealing with globally where, you know, you're a creator, you're, you like to be amongst the people, you're somebody who feeds off energy of people and gives it back tenfold, kind of like I do as well. Um, during these unprecedented strange times we've been living in this year globally with uh, all the different situations that we've had to you know, tackle. How have you been staying creative and, and connected and got those creative juices continuing to flow, my friend? Well, um, with the encouragement of, of some of the younger guys in my team, um, and indeed the great Roy Buckley, the last of the great balladeers, 
Um, they persuaded me when everything stopped. I mean, our business, as you know, Jim, just fell off the edge of a cliff. Yes. Um, and so in order to keep active and not, you know, the option was to sit in a corner, curl up in a ball uh, and feel sorry for yourself and blame everybody from the government to the Chinese. <laughs> or, you know, you could you could get on with it. So, um, as I said, the, the, the guy said, Phil, online is the only way you're going to keep in, keep in touch with your uh, with your friends, your followers, your believers. Um, that's what we did. We started um, 22 weeks ago. We started on Saturday afternoons, the Lockdown Lounge. We did a half an hour from this very piano where I would play a few tunes, tell the stories behind uh, the songs, read a few excerpts from my book. And, uh, and and that was a great way for me to have some structure in my week. Then during the week we would drop we would drop a, a, a video that we would pre-record here in the uh, in, in the lockdown lounge with maybe Roy Buckley, with my lovely wife Geraldine Brannigan, uh, with George Hutton, or some of my guests. So we kept a kind of a repertory company going here. We kept a, we kept content, um, and it, as I said, gave me some structure in the week and and kept me kept me creative, and it, we. We kind of, we, we put our energies into, I mean, a bit of reinvention, really, Jim, you know, yeah. uh, adapting to the new reality. We have, we, we've just finished revamping our, our website to make it much more. Websites used to be like maybe just a PR exercise, but right. now it's, they're, they are the conduit. They are the, I mean, it's through the online thing that we, that we keep in touch with our, with our believers. So the website now is much more user-friendly. It's much more focused. It's much more. Uh, to get people access into like behind the scenes, what actually goes on in the Phil Coulter world. Um, so that's, in fact, that's due to unveil uh, next week. So we, 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 uh, we've been keeping busy with project. In fact, another one, this is, this is my latest one, Jim. Ooh, really nice. Really nice. Tell oh, us about that. It's a double vinyl. Um, of some of the greatest hits. This is volume one, numbered. This is this is number one because it's my own. But there's only a thousand of these pressed, um, and it's it's a double a double vinyl of uh, a selection of the kind of the most requested, uh, I suppose, the greatest hits really. Um, and that's excited me greatly because I mean I'm a vinyl kind of guy. You know, all of my early hits were on vinyl. Even classic tranquility, sea of tranquility. All my early piano albums were all on vinyl. So I just love. I just love the idea, you know, that you have a thing, you know, a possession rather than a download. This you can actually look at it, you can read the stuff on it, you can look at the pictures. Um, that's my idea of that's my idea of the record business. So I'm that's just released next week. So again, it's another, you know, it's another horse running, it's another interest, it's something else to keep me challenged and stimulated. Absolutely. I still have all of my albums. I was telling uh, somebody the other day that I actually have a climate controlled storage unit that we pay monthly for filled with LPs, cassettes, reel to reels, CDs. I mean, years and years and years of music from all around the world. Uh, and we'd have a situation where one is a sealed LP. What is the LP that you play? <laughs> the other one, oh, you, yeah. keep, you keep the other one sealed. <laughs> yeah. And still have the turntables, the double cassette decks, the the speakers that are this big because I like music that um, fills the house. Oh yeah, versus I the big JBL speakers that were that size with yeah. the top of a wardrobe. Yeah, right. Nice old very miniature. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. It's forced in your ear now. It's like you know you got to stuff it in your ear, and I like it filling the house. But here's the other thing about the vinyl, Jim. It has a sound, you'll remember, that has a sound that is much warmer uh, than yeah. the digital sound, which is cleaner. But, of course, records today tend to sound as if they're processed yeah. rather than produced. It's all yeah. very clean and very clinical. But even warts and all, a vinyl has got that has got that warmth, it has got that human thing about it, you know? Um, Absolutely. So, yeah, that's, that's, my, that's my new toy. My new that, toy. Listen, <laughs> you, you mentioned, you mentioned uh, Sir James... Um, that's yes. one of the best, one of my favorite uh, collaborations done through the years. Um, and in honor of Jimmy, if he is, if, if Jimmy and and and, uh, and Jeannie are watching, yeah, I, I'm going to play. I'm going to play one of our one of the tracks that we recorded on. We did we did a couple of albums. Oh, we we had great fun together. We uh, we toured the states a couple of times. We played the Carnegie Hall. We played the White House together. We played the Nobel Peace Awards. I mean, we had a, we had a lot of fun. But just um, so you know, Phil, we have. Uh, 
members of Celtic Thunder watching, uh, Celtic Woman watching, the High Kings are watching, uh, Sir James Galway's watching, Jean's watching, Roy Buckley's here, George Hutton. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's like old home week. You mean, there's no important people watching, no? There are, you and I. And our Lovity viewers, of course. They're oh, new of course. Owned. The Lovities. Oh, Jimmy, Jimmy, this is for you. Thank you. That's one of uh, one of Jimmy and I started off as an as an instrumental uh, lament for the uh, for the wild geese. Then it became uh, a song called "Remember Me, Recuerda Me," sung by Celtic Thunder and many others. Yeah. Tell us, yeah, uh, you had an early on involvement with Celtic Thunder. Tell us about that. Some people uh, that know Celtic Thunder might not realize that. I knew it, of course, with involvement with Celtic Thunder and yeah. with the guys um, over the years. Well, Yeah, um, this is a kind of touchy subject, Jim, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk you through it uh, in as discreet a way as I can. Um, Sharon Brown, who had been involved with Celtic Women in the early days, and then that all went sour. Um, and so she was hurting and smarting a lot from that and talked to me and said she, she had come up with this idea of starting um, a male version uh, and wanted to call it Celtic Man. Well, straight away, I said, oh, Sharon, that's not a great idea for a start off. And before you go any further, because Celtic Woman's a proven winner. Um, and to call an, uh, to call something in, in the competition Celtic Man is not very smart because it sounds a bit like vindictive, number one. Number two, more importantly, there's no judge in the world who will allow uh, who will allow you to do that if, there, if there's a claim um, by the Celtic Woman people for example that you're passing off that you're that you're that you're kind of um that you're capitalizing on on that on the, the name etc so anyway that was the first that was our first uh, discussion cut a long story short um i agreed to to become a co-creator with her of celtic of 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 the male version at that stage without a name she kept calling it celtic man and i refused to buy into that so we did. We held the auditions. Uh, the concept, which we had discussed between us, was to get five different uh, stars. Five, well, not stars at all. Five different performers who would who, who would bring different personalities, different voices, different ages. It was like a kind of an a la carte menu almost of singers. Um, and we auditioned in uh, in uh, Ireland here, uh, high up and low down, um, in in uh, in Scotland. Um, and I remember. When we, we were embarking upon uh, upon that episode, she said, right, we have to go now and find our five singers. I remember distinctly saying, four. Four? Why? I said, we've got one. I've got one in the bag. This kid called Damien McGinty, who's 14 in Derry. I've already listened to him. I have a CD. I have him on ice waiting for an opportunity. So we found four. So in Derry also, we found Keith Harkin, then Ryan Kelly, Paul Byram in Dublin, and of course, Big George. 
Um, then the hard work started because with the exception of Paul Byron, who had some professional experience, the others were, were just rookies, really. Um, so we, we, it was it was uh, it was boot camp for a couple of weeks up sure. in the studio in County Adam. I mean, serious boot camp, long hours uh, yeah. of uh, of beating the whole thing into shape, teaching the guys the songs, teaching them how to sing the songs, teaching them how to sing in harmonies. And for me, um, I had locked myself away for like five weeks or so, five six weeks to write the show and write the specific songs. Anyone who remembers the original Celtic Thunder will remember the specific songs like uh, um, Ryan Kelly's, uh, uh, they, they say that I'm a bad boy, uh, da, 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 or, or, or like like uh, A Bird Without Wings with um, Damien and and, uh, and Big George, um, yeah, uh, yeah. Woman with Paul and, and, and Ryan. So there were a lot of songs that I, that I had written specifically for those characters, specifically for the show. The opening, um uh, was again very much part of it that was all conceived everything was was carefully constructed so the point i'm making is that from earliest days from earliest days the whole the whole breathing life into this notion was coming out of here um and, and the in simple terms the understanding with sharon was sharon you look after the, the the business you look after the pbs and all that kind of stuff leave me to look after the creative stuff i'll not interfere with you and i just ask you not to interfere with me and, and that's how it worked for the first uh, couple of shows and i even went on the road um to conduct an md um the first couple of tours and we recorded the very first special here in dublin uh the others we recorded in the united states um and um they were great. I mean, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the guys. I enjoyed to see them uh, growing into themselves as performers. And I, it was it was especially thrilling on the uh, on stage, like Radio City Music Hall, for example, at the start of the show uh, with Heartland, which was my opening. Uh, to hear that, to watch the guys arriving on on, on scene and hear the feedback, we had sold out two nights in Radio City Music Hall. Um, so those were great memories, and they were great. Uh, they were great. Uh, uh, creatively, it was it was a great challenge and very satisfying. Um, sadly, sadly, without going into too, too much of the detail, but sadly, the that understanding that uh, that um, I would look after the creative thing while Sharon looked after the business, the, the lines got a bit blurred, um, and well, uh, we kind of locked horns a bit, um, um, and I got the distinct feeling that that. Uh, Sharon, having having sampled and, ex and experienced some success with Celtic Thunder, wanted really to have to be the only hand on the tiller, if you like. Um, up until then, we were jointly making those decisions. Um, and when she would come on the road uh, to make some uh, maybe harebrained ideas, I was the one who would say, Sharon, that isn't going to work. No, that's not going to work. Um, I think probably she bridled at that and began to think that... Um, you know, it was her concept, and she could deliver it. I mean, this is this is only my opinion, but I will tell you this: that within weeks of my uh, vacating the premises, the trucks were 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 rebranded Celtic Thunder, created by Sharon Brown. So, uh, old Phil here was kind of airbrushed out of the history. But that's a show business, Jim. It sure is. Yeah, you're right. It definitely is. Well, we do have some beautiful, happy times as well. And, and this is a, a fabulous picture of you with the with the gang and the yeah. lost, the lost, uh, all all great guys too, Neil and Keith and and like you say, Damien and Emmett and uh, Emmett O'Hanlon and Ryan and and of course uh, George who we lost, um, which was a very sad loss. Uh, George was extraordinary. All great guys with their unique talents with, uh, definitely with Celtic Thunder. I've had a pleasure to, uh, like you've worked with them, I've had a pleasure to interview them all. And they're, they're just, they speak from their heart. They're very talented and it's a cool group. We have something I must, else. I must tell you about Big George. I think Big George oh, was George. my favorite. Yeah. My, Big George is my favorite of the lot. Why? Because for Big George, um, it was a dream come true. George told me himself he thought that um, uh, th that a career in show business had passed him by. You know, he worked in a, in a bus building uh, company since he was 18 years of age. Yeah. He sang 
in, in Jinty McGinty and a couple of the Irish pubs in, in Glasgow at weekends, but that was it. He thought it all passing by. So it's just very funny. When we when we set the auditions uh, for Celtic Thunder in Glasgow, George told me himself he turned up for the auditions. He said, he said, I didn't think I was going to get the gig, but he said, because I've been singing so many Phil Coulter songs for years, I wanted to have a look at him and see what he looked like. What he looks like. <laughs> That's true. So I have to tell you that George did possibly the worst audition of all of the auditions we did for Celtic Thunder. So, I mean, he was nervous, um, forgot his words, and just kind of, it just flopped. So we kind of drew a bit of a blank in Scotland, went back to, to Dublin to, to, to reassess what we'd got. And I remember saying, you know what? I think the big guy, I think the big guy's got it. And I remember Sharon saying, but but he was a terrible, it was a terrible addition. I said, you know what? I think he's got a quality that is going to be very important for this show, which is likability. And I said, his his failings as a performer and a singer, I said, we can address those. Let's get him over and give him another shot, give him another audition. So we brought him over, give him a second audition, which was worse than the first one. <laughs> <laughs> which was worse, I promise you, it was worse. I thought, oh God, George, you're breaking my heart. But uh, with a bit of battle, with a bit of battle, I persuaded the powers that be, uh, let's run with George. And you know what, he was he was ideal. It was, it was one of the best calls because he appreciated every single step. He appreciated everything about it. Even the middle of the of that boot camp that I mentioned earlier on, it was a lot of hard work, which was new for all those guys. A lot of that wood shedding, a lot of those cold face hours. Yeah. Uh, I remember they were having supper one night and I was kind of passing through and I heard I heard them complaining about, somebody complaining about how hard the work was. And a big George said, what, you think this is hard work? If you want to stand at the bloody bus stop at eight o'clock in the morning, you're on your way to the factory, that's bloody hard work. <laughs> so he brought a great voice of reason to the whole thing. Yeah, George. yeah. And he I love the way he embraced it. The, yeah. the life said he didn't, you know, he didn't think he was entitled. No, he loved no. It, but he so finally get yeah. So yeah, every time I had an opportunity to, to uh, interview George, uh, he was nothing more than gracious and humble, and 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 all the guys, Damien, Ryan, Neil, you know, mm. Keith, all of them, the Emmets, um, just warm and humble and engaging, and they really understand you know, uh, the fans and, and the, the fan base and the audience and, and George, yes, very, very humble about it all. And it was just something he enjoyed so much and, uh, really uh, an incredible, uh, loss. I want to go back just a little in time here because we have some very cool photos here. Um, who is oh. this young, good looking chap here? Wow. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, the good-looking chap is Bill Martin, my partner. I knew you'd say that. I knew you'd say that. <laughs> Phil Coulter, this is your life. <laughs> yeah, my God. Yeah, so, that's uh, – I remember the coat very well. The coat is a white leather uh, trench that's, coat, that's which it. was my a gift to myself after we, we won the Eurovision Song Contest, Pop It on the String, 1967, with the first royalty check, I went out and bought that coat. Yeah, yeah. So what was happening here? Were you just – chatting about business or was this a you know photo shoot or yeah it was a photo shoot because now all of a sudden we were hot songwriters all of a yeah. sudden we had yeah. we had won the eurovision song contest we were number one in every country in europe and yeah. this was a great adventure so uh the the uh our publisher thought we should get some some press photographs so yeah. there we were doing our best to look cool windswept and interesting <laughs> <laughs> cool, windswept, and interesting. I, I like that. Here's another shot. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, that's the following year where uh, Cliff Richard, there's me on the left. There's next down is Cliff Richard, lower down. Scylla Black, another big uh, star, God rest her soul. And yeah. then Bill Martin, my uh, my uh, my then partner on the right. That was the following year. That was that was 1967, we owned the Eurovision with, uh, with Puppet on the String, 1968. We came within one point of winning it again with congratulations, sung by Cliff Richard. Mm, another cool shot here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot more hair on the job then, I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> jacket, though. Nice jacket. I don't remember that jacket. That's a very cool jacket. Oh, now we're talking dead cool. That was my rapper. That was my, that was my rapper style there, obviously. Is that the, the same uh, room you're in now with all the uh, discs? No, that's a long time ago. I saw that was in our very flash office in uh, in London, overlooking the Houses of Parliament and the River Thames, uh, with another wall of of of, uh, 
of gold and, and platinum yeah. records. Oh, yeah. Again, I was trying very hard to look cool. And you still have that hat or, or, or something similar, don't oh, you? Oh, version thereof. No, I yeah. still a version thereof. There it is. Yes, yes. I'm a collector of hats. Yes, I'm a me collector too. of hats. Me my father too. was a great. Uh, there are people who people wearing hats who should never wear hats. Right. You either have a head that's meant for a hat or it's not. Uh, my dad had a head that was meant for a hat. I have a head that's meant for a hat. A lot of people wear hats who should be wearing baseball caps. <laughs> right. <laughs> or transplants or, or something. Uh, Probably. A couple more quick ones we have here. This is a nice one. Oh, yeah. That's a bit moody. Yeah. <laughs> that's, the, that's the moody one uh here's another now tell us about this oh yeah this was uh this was one of my one of my great passions um outside of outside of music um was motorsport yeah and for a number of years i i drove rally cars i i uh yeah i compare when i finished uh my 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 rallying career i i then worked my way up to i was an internationally graded uh driver I had an international license, which meant that I could compete in any international event. Um, and while I was never going to be a world champion, in my, in my last uh, three or four rallies, I finished in the top 10, which was good enough for me. At least I, I didn't kill myself or anybody else. Right. <laughs> that is always, that is the bottom line with it all, right? <laughs> well, in motorsport, I mean, I stopped doing that because, you know, I just lost my nerve. And then yeah. I had too many kids to, uh, to feed, clothe, and educate. Yeah. Um, it wouldn't be a smart move for their father to be killed in a in a in a motorsport accident, you know. No. I mean, <laughs> collectively, you know, um, I've got nine kids uh, yeah. over my two marriages, so that's that's a lot of mouths to feed, Jim. Oh yeah, there's there's there, oh that's Geraldine and our si that was our wedding day, Beautiful. our six kids, our six kids, yeah, and there's. Right on the right on the end there, extreme extreme right is uh, Dominique, who's my producer today, who's my, <laughs> making sure that everything goes according to plan. Doesn't trust oh. me with a laptop. Yeah, those are our six kids on our wedding day. It was the funniest thing Jim, because um, the following morning we went on honeymoon to Rome, complete oh. with the six kids. Did you? <laughs> it's like the Brady yeah. Bunch. <laughs> no, it, was no it was more just kind of. Uh, uh, pizza and pasta and, uh, yeah. and for daddy Peroni beer, but it was uh, it was a lot of fun. Oh, that's fabulous! And of course, that's herself. Yeah, the child bride. That's early. Right. Juanita was mentioning um, how very popular and successful in uh, South Africa. They love Geraldine, and she wished you guys well. She's watching nice in South Africa. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'd really love to hear that. Yeah, she was very successful. She had a bunch of hit records down in uh, in South Africa. She was she was a big success down there, um, and did uh, the television campaigns for like Levi Jeans and all kinds of things. She was quite the celebrity. Down. I mean, she was the she really was the performer in our family before I started performing at all. I was happily making my living as a songwriter and a record producer and a conductor before Classic Tranquility. The success of that album kind of catapulted me into a different world as a performer, but. Uh, Geraldine had notched up a lot of hits before then. Uh, Roy Buckley said he's never getting in a car with Phil again. <laughs> <laughs> he saw that racing well, shot. Look, I'll leave you walk in the rain the next time, Roy. Yeah. <laughs> cool shot here. Oh yeah. Now uh, Bruce Johnson on the uh, with with the, with the, uh, the on my right hand side with the white shirt. Um, he's a pal of mine, and that's Mike Love. They're two of the original Beach Boys. Yeah. Uh, Bruce is a great pal, great, great talent, and a great songwriter. Um, you know the Barry Manlow hit, I Write the Songs, that made oh, the yeah. whole world sing? Yeah. Everybody thinks Barry Manlow wrote that. Barry Manlow did not write that, even though the song says, I write the song. Bruce yeah. Johnson of the Beach Boys wrote, I Write the Songs. That's he also right. wrote a great song called Disney Girls and a bunch of other stuff. Bruce is a real, real sweet guy and a wonderful talent. Great guitar player, great singer, great writer. And Mike... Mike is just, uh, he's just, an, he's just like a kind of a 75 year old hippie. Yeah. <laughs> Another great shot here. Yeah. yeah. Really yeah. beautiful. And this one too is really, really nice. Beautiful. You've, you've, you've rifled through my scrapbook, Jim, I see. We have really dug deep to, to give the, the complete 
understanding of this. Uh, oh, there's a mean and moody one there. <laughs> well, that's that's a great. That's my son that's Ryan. Your son, right? At his wedding, yeah, in uh, in Mexico. Uh, Ryan and Jarek. Ryan um, is uh, he's goalkeeping coach with Houston Dynamo. He's a professional uh, soccer uh, player and coach. Um, but they were married uh, January of last year in, in Mexico. That was a fantastic event. All the all the uh, all the family turned up. There's me flashing a, a yellow tie and a blue suit. Very smart, Phil. Very nice. Yeah, going Somebody through the whole world here, Jim. Do you have a Phil Coulter uh, clothing collection line yet? <laughs> Coming no, soon. no, no. Uh, maybe, maybe I've missed the boat on that. It wasn't. Yeah. It's, it's kind of de rigueur now when you sell a few records. You know, no, you have to have a clothing line, line. The, or a perf or a uh, men's cologne. This yeah. uh, was quite an honor, I know, for you, Phil. Tell us about this momentous occasion. Yeah, that, was, uh, that was an honorary doctorate from the uh, from the Open University. That's. Um, my 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 pals keep keep uh, keep pulling my leg and call me doctor 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 doctor. I yeah, have, yeah. I have uh, four four doctors, um, uh, but uh, it still doesn't it still doesn't mean that I could I could put a plaster on 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 a bad cut, you know. Um, <laughs> four honorary doctors from four different universities. I mean, <laughs> you know, it impresses the postman, but it doesn't do much else. It doesn't get me it doesn't get me a seat in a in a in a fancy restaurant, or it doesn't get me uh, you know. <laughs> Doesn't get me booking. <laughs> no, it's kind of it's nice, you know. It, yeah. it, it's it's nice to be acknowledged. It is nice to be honoured and respected like that. Especially my Queen's University in Belfast, which yeah. was uh, which I think the first one. That was lovely to go back. Um, uh, it was a kind of a circle being completed, Jim. You know, I mean, absolutely. I, I, I don't know a lot. It certainly did. Absolutely, and you know, you've documented so much of your life. And again, I've been reading this. Um, tell us about the inspiration that I really suggest people get this. If you want to really learn more about this brilliant man and all the incredible, uh, lives he's touched, but his own experiences from in his own words, this book, which, you know, I appreciate your sending and, and autographing. It was a beautiful thing to do, Phil, well in advance of our interview, or I don't even call this an interview. These are conversations. An interview is question, answer, question, answer. <laughs> I like to have conversations. What was the inspiration? When did you say, you know, I need to put this down on paper, bruised, never broken? Well, I'd been approached a number of times by different publishers to write uh, an, an autobiography. There's a difference between an autobiography and a memoir. In my yeah. book, that's a memoir, yeah. which an autobiography is more kind of chapter and verse, you know, dates, times, and, and very specific timelines. A memoir is really just rifling through your memory bank and the, the stuff you file away and picking out the ones that you want to really remember, I suppose. Um, so I'd been over the years, I'd been approached by a number of publishers, but I I kept kicking the can down the road, and that's the truth. But um, there's a great pal of mine here, Eamon Dunphy, who's who is uh, a soccer pundit and a very successful writer himself, a very, very bright guy, and great fun, great friend. And it was he, uh, with his experience, the benefit of his hindsight as, as, as a writer of several successful books, he said, Phil, listen. You better you better knuckle down and write this thing while you can still remember it. <laughs> <laughs> that that kind of focused my thinking a bit, you know, um, because th thankfully the memory still hasn't gone. But uh, who can tell? But it was uh, <laughs> who uh, can tell? <laughs> it was um, it was hard work, you know. It was hard work, but having having completed, I'm glad I did it. It's just a lot of man hours. There's a lot of uh, there's no shortcuts because the publisher did say we can we can assign you a ghostwriter and you just tape your stories into a tape recorder and he then put it all together in his own words. I said no no no. That for me would be cheating, you know. After all, I've made my living for 55 years as a writer, albeit of, of music and lyrics. But I think it would be a cop out for me to get anybody else to do it. Um, so no, I took the I took the hard course, and I'm glad that I'm glad that I did. I'm glad that I did because now it's a kind of monkey off my back, and it's there for posterity. 
And what do you hope people are left with when they read that book? What do you hope, you know, remains with them? Uh, there's a lot of comments coming in here. Great book, highly recommend. We love it. This book is amazing, phenomenal read. We hope Phil does uh, an audio book version so we can hear his voice. They're already putting audio uh, uh, orders in <laughs> for an audio book. <laughs> well, well, well. See, that's great. So but there's a few dollars in the making there, maybe. Um, I, I, want to put, I just want people to know it's not just a list of the songs that, I, that I've written or the records that I've produced or the tours that I've done. Um, that just, it's a bit more of the human side, you know, and the, 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 the battles and the, uh, the ups and the downs, the, uh, the trials and the tribulations, because that's why the very title, which is taken from, um, from the last verse of The Town of Love So Well, now the music's gone, but they carry on for their spirits been bruised, never broken. So I picked that just that phrase as the title for the uh, for the book because I think I, I thought it kind of said what I wanted to say. You know, I've been uh, I've had my highs and lows, and I've had some 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 painful moments in my life. I've had some some thrilling experiences that not many people get in their lives. Yeah, and so overall, it's been uh, it's been a pretty good deal. A couple of people asked um, if there's if it is possible. There is this beautiful song that you wrote. Uh, in tribute to your son um, with Down syndrome. Uh, did you want to tell us a little bit about that and maybe perform a little of that for the audience? They've been asking to notice throughout the afternoon for that song. I'll tell you what I'll do. Um, I will, I'm looking at my, at my watch here, Jim, and I'm loving a conversation, but I know that I have to be in the recording studio to do a piano overdub. Um, yeah, yeah. Or, or anything tomorrow. So, um, yeah, that was my my uh, my first son was born with Down syndrome, and it was, I suppose, to be honest, um, a way of 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 me coming to terms with that, some kind of therapy, really. That in the months that followed, um, I started working on the song. And again, as I mentioned earlier on, to have a voice like Luke Kelly of the Dubliners on hand, um, I knew that he had the voice number one and the integrity to sing uh, about a, you know, about a, a very sensitive subject like that. Um, that that made it not easier, but at least I knew I had a voice that I could gear the song towards. Um, um, and it's a song which probably probably would be well. Um, funny as it happens, Luke Kelly had he had he had he survived would have been celebrating his 80th birthday on on Tuesday. So you know what? It's probably a nice note if you don't mind uh, that by getting pushed for time. But it's probably uh, Jim. It's a nice note for me to to. Uh, end up with a, I, I'll sing just a, a piece of, of scorn at his simplicity, a nod yeah. towards um, the great Luke Kelly, who, as I say, would have been, would have been 80 on, uh, yeah. on, uh, on Tuesday. Yeah. So if, if you're okay with that, Jim, if that's my exit strategy. That would be beautiful. That would absolutely be beautiful. And then we'll say a goodbye right after. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. See the child with the golden hair yet eyes that show the emptiness inside do we know can we understand just how he feels or have we really tried see him now as he stands alone and watches children play a children's game simple child he looks almost like the others, yet they know he's not the same. Scorn not his simplicity, but rather try to love him all the more. Scorn not his simplicity, oh no, oh no. See him stare, not recognizing that kind face that only yesterday he loved. The loving face of a mother who can't understand what she's been guilty of. How she cried, tears of happiness, the day the doctor told her it's a boy. Now she cries, tears of helplessness, and thinks of all the things he can't enjoy.
scorn not his simplicity, but rather try to love him all the more. Scorn not his simplicity, oh no, oh no. That's absolutely, yeah. That's like I said, you have this remarkable understanding of the human condition. You've done all this music, the music that has sold millions. You've worked with some of the greats, Elvis Presley and so many others, but the music that really stands the test of time are these songs, truly, Phil. You are really a musical treasure. Um, and uh, it's an honor and a blessing to know you, uh, to call you a friend, to welcome you to our show, to spend this amount of time with us, opening up about your life, your, ins your inspirations, your experiences, truly. And the audience has touched all of our lovely viewers from around the world. And uh, I encourage people to continue to get your music, to continue to, um, relish in your music also this one too which i can talk about once uh, you know you head off to to lay down those tracks and i appreciate your sending this as well i've always admired your work uh, i've always admired you and this has been truly a, a blessing to have you on the show and before we go i just had one quick last question what continues to inspire you to be able to inspire us through your music as you still do today, Phil Coulter? Well, um, the alternative is, is not too attractive because the alternative is, is to retire and do nothing. Um, and it's not in my nature to do that. Um, you know, I was taught a long time ago in St. Columns College that if, if God has given you talent, He's also given you an obligation to do something with that talent. Um, and I still believe that. And I still uh, I still continually want to challenge myself, even at this advanced stage. Um, I mean, this whole online adventure has been a steep learning curve for me. You're looking at an old dog who's had to learn some new tricks. So as long as I can keep doing that, and keep the brain stimulated, as long as my health stays good, I'll keep doing it. Well, we will always be here, Phil, and uh, I appreciate the time. I hope uh, this show met your expectations and you enjoyed your time with me as much as I certainly have with you, my friend. Thank you, Jim. It's been a pleasure. Continued good health and keep doing the good work. I don't know how you've got the, the stamina or the appetite to do this every day, but I admire you, man. I take my hat off. I thanks for having me, Jim. And thanks to all of your all your believers out there. God bless. And follow me on my website, guys, and it'll keep you filled in on what I'm up to. PhilCoulter.com. All right. You take care. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you, Jim. Phil Coulter online. That's the place to go. God bless you all. Thank you. I got to go. You got to go. <laughs> and there he goes. And there's this beautiful. Let me see. All the beautiful records. Bye-bye. <laughs> A little behind the scenes there for you. Hey, gang, don't go anywhere because we have some great music coming up. We have some clips of Phil that he sent along that we're going to share with you. I uh, just want to take, this show is very interactive. So if you're just joining us for the first time, you notice we show a lot of viewer comments. Uh, we are very engaged with the audience. This is what I do as a television or radio host and presenter. And let's take a look at some of the viewer comments from around the world. If you're just joining us for the first time, I am your host, Jim Masters. We do this show every day live on YouTube at Jim Masters TV. Sometimes we're also on Facebook at Jim Masters TV. I encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, if you're looking for interviews with Ryan Kelly and Damian McGinty and Chloe Agnew and uh, Mia McGoon, wonderful Irish flautist, we just did that two weeks ago, and Neil Byrne and so many others, uh, they are all there. We've done interviews with uh, all of those fabulous folks from uh, Celtic Woman and the wonderful Celtic Thunder. And I've had an opportunity to interview uh, the folks from Celtic Thunder. They're fabulous. And, um, and so many more interviews from 
all walks of life, from television, film, music, Hollywood, Broadway, health and wellness, science, food, comedy. We do it all because this is an entertainment lifestyle talk show series where we bring back the lost art of conversation and we do it with inspiration, positivity, and um, levity. And you've probably seen that word a lot during this broadcast. So don't go anywhere because we have some more performances from Phil we're going to show in just a second that he graciously sent our way exclusively for the Gym Master Show Live. But first, let's uh, do a little host chat and chat with some of our viewers watching on our YouTube channel right now. And again, we encourage you to subscribe to the channel. If you haven't, click the notification bell so you don't miss anything because we put a lot of content, all the episodes of the Gym Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show series are there. But we also have inspirational videos that I do called Master's Mantras and a lot of other cool things. Um, Marjorie Hunter says, thank you, Jim and Phil Coulter. It is our pleasure. Bernadette Vidal, it's good to see you here, Bernadette. And I'm glad you were able to comment. When you subscribe to the channel, YouTube channel, you're able to then comment. Jim, that was a terrific chat with Phil. Great stuff. Thank you. My pleasure. And uh, Karen says, God be good to you. We thank you. Denise, God bless you, Phil. Uh, God be good to you. We sing. That's absolutely beautiful. Phil, don't you dare retire. <laughs> and he'll be able to see these uh, when he watches this in the archive. Phil is still top uh, at the top of his game. You got it. I agree 100%. And Roy, looking forward to you joining us as my special guest on the Gym Master Show Live. Uh, Roy Buckley is coming. Corner Boy is coming. George Hutton is coming. We're working with Keith uh, Harkin, lots of others that are coming as well. And uh, amazing people. If you want to keep abreast of who's coming up on the show, just go to our Facebook page at Gym Masters TV. We try to post in advance who's coming up. Uh, and you can like the page, Gym Masters TV on Facebook. Also Instagram, I'm at Gym Masters TV and Twitter, I'm at Gym Masters TV. And we pr cross promote all of the episodes and my career in television and radio separate from this show, my professional career, we talk about it there as well. Um, and also on, on YouTube as well, you can see advanced episodes that are coming up. We've got a busy week of amazing guests all week long this week too. Uh, thank you for sharing your life, your music, your heart. See you in the crow's nest, MJ. Love that as well. Just a second, we're gonna play some more music from Phil and video as well. Thank you so much for visiting with us today, Phil. You're definitely a lovely now. Please come back soon. He had to, uh, he and I talked, he has a, um, couple of tracks that he has to record uh, by about, well, it's going to be about almost five o'clock Eastern time here, but uh, where he is, um, he's got to get there to the other side of the studio and get in there and get recording. So, um, but we talked for almost two hours. Could you imagine that? Thank you both gentlemen. It was a pleasure to hear you both. Thank you very much. Um, always brings tears. Thank you, Phil, for putting into words what life brings us through that is so beautiful. He's very open about his life, all the different experiences. Kathleen Walker, dear friend of mine in New York City, really nice. Thanks for sharing your talents with us, Phil. Bernadette, thank you again, Phil. Please stay safe, stay well. Um, good thing you have your tissue. <laughs> thank you so much, Phil and Jim. Made my day. Stay well and stay safe. And thanks so much for doing this, Phil and Jim. It is our pleasure. Thank you, Phil. Stay safe. Thank you, uh, Phil and Jim. Brilliant chat from the town I love so well, Nathan McCourt. Nathan, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And um, if you guys have more folks you'd like to see on the Gym Master Show live, we have them from, again, television, film, Broadway, Hollywood, or in the United States, from all over the world. We had Oscar Blue, who is from Ireland. He was on the show about a week ago, uh, and he was fantastic. He played live for us as well. He's 22 years old. He's going to university in Dublin at Trinity University, and uh, he's really, really cool cat. He was with us. And uh, Matt Steady, who is a fantastic uh, musician, Celtic blues musician and songwriter, he was with us last night for a great chat and for fantastic music. Uh, you can see that on the YouTube channel as well. And he was live from Leicester, England. And that was last night. Juanita, so beautiful. Thank you, Phil, for the time. Let's play a little more music before we wrap up. Thank you, Phil. Please uh, stay safe and well. Thanks for all the beautiful comments. We have lots of comments here. We're going to go through some more. 
If you're just uh, joining us for the first time, I encourage you to stick with us. We're here. We've been doing this show 29 weeks. Uh, and again, this is what I do for a living as far as um, I work professionally in television and radio. And then I created this show because for years people told me to do an entertainment lifestyle talk show series like this. So we built a home studio. This is the home studio here. <laughs> we built this home studio 29 weeks ago just for the Gym Master Show Live. And it's cool. We have characters <laughs> like George Burns, the famous comedian. He's always here all the time as well. Uh, I Dream a Genie is here from the Genie Bottle. She's in there. She says hello and uh, all kinds of cool characters. But first, we've got some more music. So let's play some more music that Phil sent to us uh, exclusively um, that um, you're going to want to enjoy. Steal Away is another one of the songs. There's a couple of more songs he didn't play today that uh, we're going to show right now with Phil. Another great conversation. Thanks, Jim. Phil is a true gentleman. Loved the time with him. I'm glad. I knew you guys would enjoy the show. I was really looking forward to it. It went by uh, lots of Irish crack. It went by real quick, didn't it? A wonderful show, Jim Stanley Edwards. Thank you very much, Stanley. Christine Clifton. Thanks, Jim and Phil, for a beautiful conversation. Phil is a brilliant songwriter, singer. Much more for making such a difference in the world through his music. He's a special lovely, absolutely. Kathy Short. Wonderful chat today, Jim. So glad I can listen in. Enjoy the rest of your day. And beautiful, beautiful from Celtic Caper Girl 1. Nice to have you with us, Celtic Caper Girl 1. Hope you'll uh, subscribe to our channel as well. Marjorie Hunter says, I discovered you when you interviewed Colm Keegan a while back. That's right. Colm was terrific. I've chatted with all the guys. Um, all these folks I've known before uh doing this series the gym master show live because i've interviewed them previously on american television uh, and all the different folks and it's just really wonderful that they pop on it was a blessing to have phil as well today all right we have some more for you from his lockdown lounge here's Appach appalachian roundup another of one of phil's favorites so more music couple more songs we've got three more songs uh, that are exclusive that we're going to share with you. So the show continues here on the Gym Masters Show live. And uh, let's play this for you right now. You're going to enjoy it. And then we'll come back and we'll chat some more and see some more of our viewer comments. Hi there. Back in the lockdown lounge. And boy, this is getting better and better, more exciting with every passing week. I was in touch with the venue uh, just the other day. And the excitement is mounting hereabouts, in the venue, in the whole of the county, in the whole of the country, in fact. Um, but listen, here's the thing. There are a number of those packages because aside from the ticket, there's a lot of other stuff. And a lot of those are going out first. And I don't want anybody to be disappointed. What did I tell you last Saturday? When I'm doing this live concert, I want you guys to be part of what I'm doing because we've been growing this family, right? Nothing will make me happier when I'm doing my gig uh, in, in October to think of, all of my guys, all of my, my Saturday lockdown loungers are out there. And, you know, here's another thing. You know, uh, I have conditioned you all in the, in the lockdown lounge on a Saturday to sing along, right? To sing along, an important part of our whole ethos, as they say. Now I have a new trick for you because what I'm going to play for you now, this is going to get you dancing. Now, even if you're in bed, you can still kind of roll over a bit or kick the old deer beside you. You have... You have to participate in this. This is one of those like happy, happy things. So anyway, I'm going to play this now. Don't forget, get on the link, get on those tickets because they're going fast. I do not want you to be disappointed. Now, here is Appalachian Roundup.
That wasn't easy. <laughs> but it was fantastic. It wasn't easy, but it was fantastic. <laughs> hey, we have another one here for you as well. Don't go anywhere, folks. More music coming up. Uh, here's another one that we're going to share with you. We're going to bring that up here. It's another uh, version that Phil did of The Old Man, which is one of my favorites with Phil. And uh, we're going to share that with you now as we queue it up. Again, these um, Phil personally sent to me for today's uh, live episode of the Gym Master Show Live. Matter of fact, they're all live episodes of the Gym Master Show Live. Uh, we're generally on 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, but sometimes when we do have artists who are in other time zones where it's really late for them, uh, like, you know, it's it's pretty, it's in the later evening there in, in wonderful Ireland and Scotland and England and Europe. So um, we adjust, we actually adjust, not all shows do it, but we will adjust the time of our show to accommodate not only the guest that I have come on, but also any of their fans and their viewers and followers. So that way there, a lot of folks uh, in Ireland, Scotland, and England have been able to join us today at an earlier time than if we started at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. But you can always watch all of our shows. You can watch this episode again with my very special guest, Phil Coulter, in the archives on YouTube at Gym Masters TV. You can share the link with the world as well. Here's another version of Phil Coulter doing the old man that he sent to me personally that we're gonna share with you as we continue celebrating wonderful music here on this episode of the Gym Masters Show Live. Enjoy folks, and then we have uh, one more song, and then we'll have a little uh, chat and tell you about some cool things that are coming up on our series. Here is, once again, he did it live for us exclusively, and now here is a produced version of this really riveting and beautiful song. Get those Kleenex again. It's the old man. Hi there. Do you know it's a funny thing, but of all of the songs that I've written down through the years, as I've got a little older and the hair's turned a little more gray, as you can see, there are only a handful of songs that have stayed really important in my own heart and soul. And they tend to be personal kind of songs, songs that have a little bit of myself in them. Now, on this very special day, here's a song that I wrote about my dad. So wherever you are, whoever you're with, I hope you have a good day. This is The Old Man. Tears have all been shed now. We've said our last goodbyes. His soul's been blessed. He's laid to rest. As now I feel alone. He was more than just my father, my teacher, my best friend. And it'll still be heard in the tunes we shared. When I play them on my own And I never will forget him For he made me what I am and Though he may be gone, memories linger on And I miss him, the old man As a boy, he'd take me walking by mountain, field, and stream. And he'd show me things not known to kings, but secret between him and me. Like the colors on a pheasant as he rises in the dawn. Or how to fish, or make a wish beside a fairy tree and I never will forget him for he made me what I am and though he may be gone 
memories linger on. And I miss him, the old man. He'd live forever. He seemed so big and strong. But the minutes fly, and the years roll by, for a father and a son. And suddenly, when it happened, there was so much left unsaid. No second chance to tell him thanks. For everything he'd done, and I never will forget him. For he made me what I am, and though he may be gone, memories linger on. God, I miss him, the old man. Mm-hmm. And a number of you have said that uh, you reached for your Kleenexes once again, and I don't doubt that. That is such a touching and very, very beautiful song. Absolutely. We have another one here for you. Uh, this one, uh, we had the actual video, so we, we wanted him to, uh, he and I talked about him playing. That one, he just, we wanted him to play that live, uh, and, and I'm so glad that he did. This one here we wanted to save because he did it in video form, so we're going to share this with you as well. Um, really cool stuff, isn't it? If you're just discovering Phil Coulter for the first time, well, I'm happy that you're doing that. If you've been a fan of Phil's for years, then, of course, you know uh, the treasure that he is. Amazing stories. Uh, and again, a lot of it is in his book, uh, which he so graciously sent me. And I'm still reading it. I'm almost finished, almost finished. So I don't want to give it away. I don't want to tell too much. But it is um, Phil Coulter. There we go. Bruised, never broken. He really, really opens up about his life. And again, uh, music and lyrics. This too, the songs I love so much. And uh, he autographed it, which I really appreciated. And uh, he wanted me to have these before we did the actual conversation. And this is really cool. This is a lot of the songs over the years and um, some of the best. I mean, Ireland's Call, of course. Many of you know Ireland's Call. Uh, you've heard that so many times. I Loved the Ground. This is uh, the songs I loved so well. And... Uh, Really, really beautiful, and uh, that you can get as well. But this particular song here, we're going to share this one with you as well. We've got this all queued up for your viewing and listening pleasure. If you're just joining us, I'm your host, Jim Masters. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, if you're wondering if Jim is Irish, yes, I'm Irish on my father's mother's side. Um, there we go. Steal Away. Um, with Phil Coulter. We're going to play this for you as well. Phil had sent this to me. Um, we had a certain amount of time because I know he had those tracks uh, that he has to lay down. So he's laying those down and um, these were put aside so we could play these afterwards just for you. And I'm happy to do it. Thanks for joining us. It's so cool to have all of you here on our Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show series, a beautiful Sunday afternoon or evening or morning, wherever you're watching, because we do have viewers all around the world. We welcome everybody if you're watching for the very first time. It's a pleasure to have you with us and join all the loveties. Everybody that watches our show is called a lovety. <laughs> and that's because I said uh, love and levity together once and everybody said, uh, we love that word. Keep that word, Jim. Uh, unbelievable talent. Yes. Timeless. You still have your tissue. I love that music book. It has some unusual ones in it, doesn't it? It really, really does. Uh, so here's more from Phil Coulter, just for you, uh, exclusively on our show. 
and we appreciate uh, Phil sending this along for you for today. And we'll be back and we'll have a, a nice wrap up, a little host chat and uh, any comments you have or questions or uh, suggestions as far as other guests you'd like to see on. We're booked with guests through December, just about. Uh, we're going to be doing some special Christmas shows. We have lots of entertainers coming on and so many more. Uh, keep abreast of our Facebook page, Gym Masters TV, and also our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV, uh, to find out the great shows we have in store. We also, just so you know, for those of you watching for the first time, we even did a two-hour show just talking about food. It was a host chat food festival show where I, as your host, was chatting with all the viewers from around the world. They sent in recipes and recipe books, and it was really cool. And I received two dozen cookies, these wonderful Christmas cookies from one of our lovely viewers, Tess LaBella, who is a wonderful actress, comedian, and voiceover artist who lives in Florida in the United States. And I'm trying to hang on to the cookies. They arrived on Saturday. <laughs> and I'm a cookie person. It was very difficult. But we put a few aside. So on Monday's show tomorrow, we have wonderful lyricist Bill Russell. He's a Broadway veteran, veteran, uh, veteran and so much more. He is joining us tomorrow live uh, as our special guest. Tomorrow, we're going to have a new viewer of the week. We always announce a viewer of the week that we celebrate, somebody who uh, loves the show and watches our show and tags everybody and shares the links and all of that fun stuff. So we celebrate our viewers that watch our show. Um, and also, we're going to show you those some of those fabulous cookies with the chocolate and the sprinkles that uh, one of our viewers, and she was a guest on our show too, and we had a blast, so much levity, so much fun. And she performed and it was just really cool. Tess LaBella, she was on a couple of weeks ago. You can see that episode on our YouTube channel. But here is more. So tomorrow, Monday, we're going to do Viewer of the Week. We have our very special guest, uh, lyricist, uh, fabulous composer and, and beautiful songwriter and so much more. Bill Russell, he is tomorrow here on the Gym Master Show Live. And uh, we're going to show you those cookies and view of the week and lots more. Always lots of surprises on the show. The show is all about connecting all of us, truly. It's about inspiring you, putting smiles on your faces. That's what we've been doing uh, for uh, 208 episodes of the Gym Masters Show Live. And I thoroughly enjoy doing this. Again, I balance all of this with my professional work in television radio, which is very busy. I do daily radio shows, I do TV shoots and a whole host of things and um, for years. So I just love doing this show with all of you. Anyway, here is Steal Away with the wonderful Phil Coulter. Enjoy, and then we'll be back with a little bit more and we'll get ready to wrap things up together. It's good to have you with us, everybody, on the Gym Master Show Live. Once again, here's Phil Coulter. Steal away, let's steal away No reason left to stay For me and you, let's start anew And darling, steal away Let's steal away and chase our dream and hope they never find us The dreary days The empty nights We leave them all behind us And steal away Let's steal away No reason left to stay For me and you Let's start anew And darling, steal away We leave behind The city streets The gloom and the desolation The rain, the cold And just growing old God knows it's a hard old station Steal away, let's steal away No reason left to stay 
for me and you. Let's start anew, and darling, steal away. We'll leave with just our memories, and we'll make a new beginning. We have to choose to win or lose, and it's time we started winning. Steal away, let's steal away. No reason left to stay. For me and you, let's start anew. And darling, steal away, steal away. Let's steal away. No reason left to stay for me and you. Let's start anew, and darling, steal away. Don't you love uh, when? he's finishing up with the song what he does with his hands have you noticed that where he goes like this and it's sort of the song sort of just trails off it sort of just fades away uh steals away and fades away uh really really beautifully done um we had an extraordinary afternoon here we started at 3 p.m eastern now we've done shows <laughs> where it really depends on the guests uh time and availability um, so we give guests uh, the complete leisure and pleasure of time. You know, a lot of times when you have conversations, uh, whether it's a host conversing with viewers or listeners, it's always rushed. It's always quick. It's always in and out. Um, with uh, guests, when you have guests from all walks of life, fields of endeavor, levels of success, uh, from everyday people to people who have accomplished extraordinary things, um, time is such a wonderful but fleeting commodity. So we always like to spend some time and we always like to uh, leave you as well as the guest and myself connected and inspired. And we always like to um, create and continue to expand this beautiful community. We started on the Gym Masters show live. Every single day we do this show live here from the United States of America. And um, we've been reaching so many fabulous people, all of you watching right now, and those of you who've joined us maybe for the very first time, or those of you who uh, maybe you've been with us for a day, a week, a month, or since day one when we started this Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show series. The point of it is to have fun, to bring us all together, to inform, uh, educate, knowledge building, inspire, have lots of levity and Hopefully, when you watch these episodes, whether you watch live and you comment, because not everybody that watches comments, of course, uh, but as you know, we have lots of viewer interaction. I like to bring the folks who take time out of their day, which I completely appreciate as a, a creator, as an artist, as a personality, a TV radio person. Um, I thoroughly appreciate wholeheartedly from the bottom of my heart the fact that you guys tune in and all these beautiful comments and all these private messages and all the uh, Facebook messages and Instagrams and posts and tagging and all the excitement that you share with me, it just tells me and, and somebody like Phil who creates beautiful music and any of us, it lets us know that what we're doing matters to you. Uh, and when we know what matters to you is the work that we're doing, um, expressing ourselves, connecting the dots together, and hopefully entertaining, putting smiles on your face and sharing with you. Um, it makes us not only feel good about what we're doing, but it also allows us to continue to grow and go forward. So that's what we've always done here on this show. And um, it's a beautiful thing to be able to have this opportunity to join you as often as we do, literally just about daily on YouTube at Gym Masters TV. And on uh, oftentimes we do it on Facebook as well at Gym Masters TV. And uh, 
it's such an honor and such a pleasure to to come into your life and and I toast all of you as much as we've toasted Phil. I toast all of you for your time and attention, for all of the levity, all of the comments, all the support as we continue to grow this show. The show is uh, is continuing to be a work in progress and. Uh, We've built a nice community here, a nice set, and we're always tweaking and always doing different things. And every show is uh, something different. Uh, it's not the same old, same old. And that's what's cool about our Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show series is the fact that it's something a little bit different. Kathleen says, you never rush your guests. You make them feel comfortable. Like you say, it's more conversation between friends, not a rushed interview. Exactly. Yeah. I, I really like to learn about people, but also... Uh, Hopefully you're left with a deeper understanding of these folks who are our guests here on the show and maybe a little more of a deeper understanding of yourself and uh, your life and also maybe a deeper understanding of, of your host, me. <laughs> We're all in this together. Mike and Jen, thank you, Jim, for an excellent gathering. It's my pleasure, my pleasure Sherry says, uh, yes, it's definitely been an extraordinary show, Jim. Thank you. My pleasure. And you're here all the time. I really appreciate that. Juanita, you as well. I'm glad you're enjoying the time. And uh, I passed along your message to Phil for Geraldine, how she's uh, beloved still in South Africa. Bernadette says it's conversational instead of peppering questions. Exactly right. I love that expression, peppering. That's exactly right. Barbara says, uh, to all first-time viewer, won't be my last slunch at Jim. You as well, Barbara. Thank you for joining us here. We love having you here on the show. Juanita as well. Thank you for all your wonderful guests you have, Jim. You are great. Thank you, Meg Hartnett. We appreciate that. That is very lovely. And uh, for those of you joining me for the first time, my hair is getting quite long. You see the guy behind me? Usually it's shorter, but I haven't had a haircut since March. And the salon called and they said, do you still love us? Is everything okay? No, we've just been growing it longer. It's kind of cool. You know, I do radi daily radio shows here out of the house uh, with the radio studio. So I haven't had to really get a cut. And I was mentioning yesterday that I was on a TV shoot for one of my professional uh, news magazine show that I host in New York. So what we did, the trick was I had a turtleneck on and a sport coat. So because the hair's a little longer, but this segment had to be, you know, more coiffed and shorter. So what we did in the studio was we sort of pulled the hair back, parted it a little bit. I think right there, we're yeah, there. And we pulled it back and we I had a turtleneck on. So we tucked it, we tucked it in the back of the turtleneck and the hair held for the amount of time that I was on camera doing the news feature segment and it was really cool and i was looking straight at camera now i couldn't do much turning because if i turned the hair would pop out of the turtleneck <laughs> and then boom secret revealed so that it was in the turtleneck it was tucked in that turtleneck and it was it was awesome <laughs> so it just looks i was reading teleprompter script that i had written which was for a news feature uh, interview segment and, uh, and it was really cool. It was just, uh, <laughs> it was awesome. And, um, so, you know, there's a lot of tricks of the trade, you know, that we all know Phil, I think Phil shared a few of them on our show today, but there's various things that, you know, you do when you're in a television studio, radio studio, or on stage to make things, make the magic work. And, uh, tucking the hair in the back of the turtleneck. I pulled the turtleneck up and then tucked the hair in. And it was really, it was, it was what you'd say magical <laughs> and it worked. Yes. Uh, I appreciate that again, Bernadette, Jim, this is one of the few shows I enjoyed. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. You always have great guests and you make it uh, easy to include us. That is my pleasure. You mean, this is one of the few shows I enjoyed listening to. I think you mean this is one of many shows you've enjoyed listening to, right? That's I think that's what you mean. <laughs> Not one of the few that you enjoyed listening to, but I think it's 
one of the many that you've enjoyed listening to. I think that's what you're saying because <laughs> you comment often and you always have these great things to say. I think that's what you men meant, right? <laughs> that is funny. Um, great to have you with us as always, Kathy and Willie with her toasting and her cheers. So we're going to wrap things up, folks. Uh, we have dinner waiting and uh, we hope you had a wonderful time. And uh, it was really extraordinary having uh, Phil with us here on the show. If you missed any of the pictures, and we'll just do a quick zip through some of those photos. Of course, there is the music uh, and lyric book. There is his book, uh, Bruised, uh, Never Broken. It's the book we were talking about here on the show. And some more we'll zip through here. Oh, you know, there was something else I wanted to show you. I love this CD. If you love Christmas music, this CD, which actually came out in 1988, is a beautiful Christmas CD. We have a lot of Christmas music here, and uh, we listen to a lot. We play a lot during the holidays. We're going to get ready to start listening. I was actually listening to this today uh, prior to the show, and I let Phil know that I have always enjoyed this album. It is a beautiful, beautiful Christmas uh, CD that he put together instrumental there are there's some light vocal in some songs but not much it really is a beautifully uh crafted christmas cd so if you like christmas music folks those of you who are staunch phil coulter fans i'm sure you probably have this already but i would recommend that it really is a beautiful beautiful cd and it's one of the many many we have in our uh christmas collection we have thousands of cds your hair has grown. Wow. I think your hair is getting as long as mine. <laughs> I think it looks kind of cool. What do you think? You like it longer? You know, sometimes we have it shorter, like right there in our logo. But uh, it's kind of cool. Blows in the wind, that's for sure. It just takes a little more time to put together. So that CD, yeah, I would recommend that. This was cool. He was talking about this in his early days in college, right? If you missed that earlier. Um you call that your lockdown mane, that hair. That's funny. <laughs> That's what I should call it as well. Cool. I think my nights or days depend on when you're on, Jim. You take us all away from everything that's going on around us, even if it's just a few hours. I appreciate that. That's beautifully said, Sherry. I'm happy to know that. Juanita, thanks, Jim, for another great show. Enjoy your dinner. Good night and stay safe. Love it. Thank you very much. Yes, all of his uh, CDs are fantabulous. Grew up on them, adding them as you grew. Now raising your kiddo on them. Great choice. Out of all the shows out there, your show is one of the few we tune into regularly. That's what Kathy meant. You're the tops, Jim. Thank you, Christine. I appreciate that. It's beautifully said. You're always here, Christine. Um, and I appreciate that because I realize not everybody can be here every day. Uh, we have lives to live, but I appreciate that. Oh, I love that. I'm going to print that out. I'm going to put that under my pillow, Kathy Short. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're one of the few people I enjoy listening to. <laughs> Thank God. Uh, well, yesterday we were... Uh, so this was uh, Phil during the college days and the Glee Man. He was talking about that. He was teasing about that. And again, some other cool shots we dug up. He loved the fact that we really dug deep in our uh, the honorary doctorates there from his uh, university. I wanted to show this too. This is just some of his albums, just some of them. Not all of them, just some of them. Um, really interesting stories that he shared. Look at him there, huh? That goes back in time. That was really cool. He was very funny about all the different looks. He's a hat person. Boy, I should have worn my hat. Usually, if you look back at some of our episodes, I do wear uh, this cool hat. And you guys, I know, Linda O'Dell loves when I wear the hat. There is uh, with... Uh, Bill uh, Martin on the left and Phil on the right. I, that's a cool leather white jacket. I, best, I bet he wishes he had that jacket now. And there is his lovely Geraldine. There he is at the piano. Beautiful shot there too. And another great shot. There he is with, of course, the fabulous Celtic Thunder. And uh, again, I had an opportunity, as many of you know, to... Uh, Interview all the guys there on the stage, George and Ryan, Paul Byram, now Phil Coulter, Damian, Keith, 
Neil, and of course, some of the other guys uh, came after uh, Emmett Cahill, as well as Emmett O'Hanlon. I want to let you know Emmett O'Hanlon is coming on the show in December. Uh, we're trying to nail down a date for Keith Harkin. He's traveling in Portugal with his wife and child. I know a lot of you have asked about Keith. I know you all asked about Emmett Cahill as well. We're hoping that comes to fruition as well. Uh, but we've done interviews with uh, my fabulous friends, Damien and Neil. They were fantastic. Paul Byram, Ryan as well. And you can see those on the uh, YouTube channel. And having had an opportunity to uh, interview George too on public television, he really was amazing. Celtic Thunder is terrific. And they really are great with their fans. Celtic Woman as well. And Phil mentioned having had involvement with Celtic Woman as well. Uh, Chloe and I are dear friends. Remember Lisa Kelly? dear friend as well, Mairead Nesbitt. If you didn't see our interview with uh, Mairead Nesbitt, who's brilliant, dear friend, fabulous person. She and I, uh, with Amir McGoon and so many others, worked with Tim Janis, the composer, on Celtic Heart up in Maine, which was uh, filmed in Maine as well as Ireland. Really beautiful. And Mairead is a true treasure and a dear friend as well. And we did a phenomenal interview with uh, Mairead Nesbitt. Uh, originally uh, Celtic Woman, uh, also Celtic Heart, Rocktopia, and a new project that's happening as well, which is exciting, and of course her solo career. Uh, if you didn't see Amir McGune, the phenomenal Irish international classical and Irish flautist, she was on about two weeks ago as my special guest, and we had a brilliant time. She played live. She's a beautiful, beautiful person inside and out, a dear friend, and uh, she was on the show. And we had a great, great time. So all of these folks that you see here, they're dear friends uh, and so happy they've all popped on. Roy Buckley's coming on. George Hutton's going to be coming on. Corner Boy, very popular in Ireland. Uh, they're coming on. And there's a few more you guys have been mentioning, as well as, of course, artists here in the United States, Canada. And again, not just uh, musical artists, but we have chefs coming on, comedians coming on, authors coming on. We have a lot of surprises. We've got some Christmas shows we're building with Christmas music and entertainers and really cool stuff. Here's a couple more shots with Phil. That too as well. Utterly beautiful. That is his son, Ryan, who got married in Mexico and his lovely bride. Great shot of Phil there. Geraldine, his lovely wife. Great shot there as well. And of course, these other shots that we used in some of our promotions leading up to our guest appearance. Want to let you know my friend Darren Holden is going to be joining us as well from the High Kings. He also was with Riverdance as well. And he has a great solo career, musician, songwriter, singer. Darren is going to be with us in December uh, as well. And a few more surprises. Monday, Bill Russell is going to be here tomorrow. Bill is a fantastic music lyricist and so much more. Broadway, you name it, he's done it. He's a great guy. He's all excited. He's going to be here tomorrow and a lot more uh, great guests that are coming up. So cool stuff. A couple more comments coming in here, and then we'll get ready to wrap up our show and have our dinner. We're having Chinese tonight. I know I should, after this show... With uh, celebrating the Irish today, I should be having shepherd's pie or bangers and mash, shouldn't I? With a nice uh, Bailey's Irish cream. I should be having that. Um, but we're going to ha we have Chinese already. Maybe we'll have the, the other tomorrow. <laughs> shepherd's pie. I love mashed potatoes. Oh, my father too loves mashed potatoes. Loves it. Until next time, lovelies, please have a wonderful evening and be safe. Uh, any of you who joined us for the first time, you are now lovelies. Phil is also a lovelie now as well. Uh, we regulars are a rare breed. Yes, you are and loved for it as well. Right on, Christine. I love it, Kathy. You guys are the best. You are true lovelies. <laughs> and I love how you communicate with each other. I, I get to see that during the show. Uh, I don't always get a chance. We don't always get a chance to show every single comment because there's always so many that scroll through, but we try to show as many as possible because I'm very viewer centric and viewer focused. I get to see you every day. So that makes me smile. Can't wait for it to be in person. I know we've got to go to lunch or dinner again. Um, uh, my friend Kathleen in New York city, um,
who was on the Rachel Ray cooking show with me, she and I together, we had such a blast. Really cool. So we're going to wrap up. And one more thing here. Let's see if we've uh, really, we've done all the uh, business we can do here. Again, if you're watching us on the YouTube channel, which you are, we would love it if you would subscribe to the channel. That would be spectacular. And that channel is YouTube at Jim Masters TV. If you have a suggestion for a guest. Now, we have lots of folks who have uh, suggestions for guests. And uh, many of them are coming on. I find a lot of guests myself. They're people I know personally, people I've asked, people I've uh, maybe worked with in television and radio over the years. Uh, but if you have suggestions for a guest, and it doesn't have to be a musical artist or, or an actor or performer of any kind, it can just be somebody who is really cool and does great things to inspire people or they're talented in some way. Uh, we do love food on this show, and we do have a, a brilliant chef that's coming up. We also might be having a guest from the Brady Bunch TV series and from the Little House in the Prairie. Stay tuned. Yes. And if you didn't see Oscar Blue, who was with us last week, live from Dublin, check that out on the YouTube channel at Jim Masters TV. But uh, there is the address for our show jimmasterstv at gmail.com. If you have any, boy, this hair is getting long. <laughs> if you have any suggestions for guests that you're thinking about, maybe uh, that we haven't thought about yet, because we I have some dear friends who also get guests. Uh, I find guests. A lot of you wonderful loveties and viewers have suggested guests and have uh, made that happen. And I truly, truly thank you from the bottom of my heart for that. Um, jimmasterstv at gmail.com is, 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 is the uh, address to uh, reach us here at the show. Uh, the other thing is some of you asked, am I seated? Yes, because for weeks I've been standing with this show for as long as we do these shows. I've been standing. So a lot of you have said, Jim, get a chair, get a chair, get a chair. So now we can, there's a lot more. Our camera angles can be moved and uh, you can see different things on set, you know, as well. There's Gilligan. You see Gilligan? Where is Gilligan? Whew. Boy, that's the only thing. Is gotta, everything is, it's, it's like being a weatherman. Everything is, when you look at the screen, it's all reversed. So, no, Gilligan is this hand. There he is. Whew. There's Gilligan. And there's the tulips that Willie likes. And... Uh, <laughs> His hair is getting crazy, crazy, crazy. Anyway, there is our um, there is our address if you have any suggestions for guests. And uh, last night I brought the mic up to the phone and you guys liked when I was talking low. So uh, we will wrap the show accordingly. Just a couple more comments coming in. We like to acknowledge the fabulous people. And yes, you saw the tulips behind us there. See those Dutch tulips back there on set, Willie? You got it. And stars and rare and hallelujah, you finally have a chair, which is very funny because I started this show with a chair. And then when we sort of expanded our set, I was standing on my feet the whole time. And then last night I said, you know what? We're going to get a chair with some comfortable pillows on it. And that's what I'm on right now. And um, boy, it was great. It was really terrific. And um, so thanks for looking out for me, folks. I appreciate that. A rare breed. LOL, Bernadette. We should go play Survivor as the Levity team. <laughs> you could play it in South Africa. So glad Roy is going to appear. He's a true storyteller of Irish songs and so humble and witty. Absolutely right. And George Hutton is as well. George is going to be with us in January. And Roy is going to be with us in uh, December. December as well. We are a true community. We absolutely are. Absolutely are. And you stay safe. And everyone, God bless you as well. And smiles to you. And uh, Juanita in South Africa. And we thank everybody for joining us on our YouTube channel today. Uh, tomorrow, we will be on YouTube and Facebook. We will be on both YouTube and Facebook. Yeah, <laughs> I'm still looking at the hallelujah. You feel better that I have a chair. Stars to you as well. So all of your friends say, take care. Ciao. Uh, Avita Zane. Au revoir. Cheers. Including Jimmy. And he's got his Irish uh, uniform on, huh? 
His childhood toy says goodnight to you as well. All right, gang, we are going to head out. We are starving. I hope you guys are too. Um, thank you so much for joining us on the Gym Master Show Live. If this was your first time, welcome. We welcome you to the land of levity and the land of uh, great episodes and good good conversation, bringing back uh, the lost art of conversation, uh, inspiration, positivity, entertainment. We do it all on this broadcast, and we thank you so much. Those of you who are our regular uh, community of levities, we thank you as well. A couple more last things here. Smiles. I love your green shirt and sweater. Do, uh, I think I mentioned this to Jen Jennifer, uh, Flower Power. I'm not sure if she was here with us today because, again, not everybody that's with us comments because uh, I look later and I'm like, my God, all those people were watching? I'm always thinking just the people comment are watching, but there's so many more that watch live and then watch later. But uh, she, we were talking about colors and I think Jen's Jen is Zen who's from Allentown, Pennsylvania flower power on YouTube said that her favorite color is orange. So she loves the orange that's in our set. Some of you like the purple, the blue, my favorite color is green. That's my favorite color. So apropos having the Irish in me, right? I love your green shirt and sweater. Enjoy your dinner. Happy. You finally have a chair. <laughs> I know. Good night, Jim and Levity. I might do some standing again, too, because I do like to move around. Like when I'm in a television studio uh, hosting, I move around a lot. If I'm not in a on an anchor desk or, you know, sitting with, you know, other co-hosts or people, I'll move around a lot. So I do like the ability to move around a lot. But um, what was the question? What, what was the question? Because uh, he's going to see this afterwards too. He'll he'll look at this after. Thanks for an interesting show, Nola Riggs. Thank you for watching. We love having you here. Hope you got a chance to subscribe to the YouTube channel so you don't miss anything. And smiles, Willie. And we're going to take off. Thanking you for your time this time. Till next time, everybody. Again, uh, we appreciate you guys being with us. A couple more things here. Don't forget to smile. We say this uh, at the end of every episode of the Gym Masters Show Live. Uh, we appreciate you guys being with us. We we thank you very much for joining us here on the show. It's always a pleasure having you here. We say hello to all the lovities all around the world. Again, if you missed the episode, you wanna watch it again, it's on our YouTube channel waiting for you at Gym Masters TV. And if you subscribe to the channel, we love it. We thank our very special guest, renowned Irish composer, arranger, songwriter, Phil Coulter. Don't forget to smile, everybody, and share that smile. And, of course, share the levity. That's what we always say here on the show. Don't forget to share the levity and find your peaceful Zen place. Mine is the ocean. We live here along the coast in the northeastern United States. So I grew up near the ocean, near the coast. So uh, if not with loving family and friends or music or writing or my career, cycling, uh, I do love food too. That's very Zen. <laughs> Tennis, the ocean is my uh, one, of, one of my Zen places. So find your Zen place uh, wherever it is. Again, working in the industry too in the various ways, shapes, and forms that I do is also uh, part of my Zen place as well. <laughs> if, I'm on, if I'm on stage or meeting people or in a radio studio or in a television studio, that's, a, that's quite a Zen place for me uh, as well, which I really, really enjoy because I get a chance to interact with fabulous people just like you. So Thank you very much. I'm going to eat now. It's time. Yes. Jen's oceans or mountains? That's a good question. I'm going to ask Phil that. I'm going to, Phil and I are going to be talking further. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to ask him that. <laughs> Does he like the ocean? He, you know, Ireland surrounded by ocean, but beautiful mountains there too. So I'm going to ask Phil if he prefer, what's his Zen place? Oceans or the ocean or mountains? All right, gang. This is your host, Jim Masters. Thank you for your time this time. Till next time, thank you so much for joining us here on the show. You guys are a blessing. This was an amazing afternoon, two hours and 41 minutes. Wow, you guys can talk. <laughs> One more comment coming in, and then we're going to say, see you later. Time for supper here, too. Very, very, very 
hungry. So with that, love you all. Thanks again for being with us. This was an outstanding show. True honor to have Phil Coulter with us. You can see this in the archive at Gym Masters TV. We'll be back tomorrow, Monday, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, live on YouTube at Gym Masters TV and also on Facebook at Gym Masters TV. Whatever you're doing the rest of your day, I hope it's a beautiful day. And I thank you for making us a part of your day. Take care, everybody. We love you all from all around the world. Two more comments coming in. Love you. God bless you too, Bernadette and Willie to you as well. All right. Take care, everybody. This was terrific. It's always great when you're there and we're together. Bye-bye. Have a good night.